Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, to set the tone for the meeting, I will read an extract from a Chapter 1 Bill story, pages 7 and 8 of the big book. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride, who, ha- who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining the endless procession of sots who had gone bef- on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What, I, what would I not give to make amends? But that was n- over now. And the topic t- of tonight's meeting is working step eight with the sponsee. And uh, Tim will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic, after which the floor will be open for questions rather than the typical sharing. And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Tim Alcolic. Um so step eight, um, the book is slightly tricky here because when you get to when you get to step eight, uh, it says, by the way, you've already got your list. That's a little little eight appearing there. You're, you've already you've already got your list. Uh, it says you made it when you took step four. Well, I mean, in the same sense that, you know, well, if you want to write a letter, all the letter, all the letters are already in the alphabet. You just have to put them in the right order. It's a bit like that with step eight. Yeah, you've you've done the list, but it step four covers an awful lot of other material as well. So I think the best way to do this is to treat step eight as a completely new exercise. You can't you can't do a step nine off the material in step four. You just can't do it. Um it, it it needs to be uh, all the extraneous material needs to be stripped out and you need to have a forensic analysis of just your behavior. So obviously the work done in step four is not wasted. It forms the basis for the work in step eight. As with step four. So when you're doing doing step four, you want to get the scope of the exercise clear first. And I think it's the same with step eight. So it's interesting. If you read Bill's story, he talks about approaching all of those uh, to whom he who he'd harmed or uh, who he'd fallen out with, basically. So what I get people to do, I think step four is very, very internal, usually. And people have a little bit of sketchy understanding of how they've been interacting with the world. This is where we want to do a proper forensic analysis um uh forensic being the adjective for for <laughs> with criminal criminal law um uh we want to do a forensic analysis of all of the relationships and so i think a very good place to begin with step eight is to do a list of all relationships present or past who you a uh definitely owe amends to or have harmed in some way or b feel uncomfortable about because if you feel uncomfortable about them well something's been missed so far you've had a good go at forgiving everyone in step four you're still upset with auntie susan well we we need to look at that you can't just brush it under the carpet And this is all on the basis of the, well, first of all, Bill's story, you want to look at two types of thing in step eight. You want to look at the people you've harmed. You want to look at the people with whom you have unresolved tension. And Sandy Beach also will say that if you've got trouble with another person, you need to either forgive them or make amends. And sometimes those are two very closely related projects, which is why putting them into one project is a very helpful, uh, very helpful exercise. Also, the step eight in the 12 and 12, I don't really use the 12 and 12, but there are some ideas in it that I borrow. 
in the 12 and 12, it will say that about the most useful thing we can do is have a thorough examination of our human relationships, because that is what has caused our failure and indeed our alcoholism. Now, I'm not going to stand in judgment as to how accurate that observation is, but safe to say, I think it's important enough not to be completely disregarded. So step eight is where we just look at how we're interacting with other people. Uh, so as with step four, you scope it out so you know the worst of it. There's nothing worse than wondering what else is in the woodwork that's going to come out. Get the name out now, then you can walk around the whole thing. And you, maybe you've got 400 names, maybe you have 200. Um, Sometimes one of one of the things that people will say, and this is very this is very common. Um, I'm going to start being naughty now. Um, people will come back with a step eight list with like eight names on it or five names. I had a sponsor that was in his late sixties, who I know from his step four had punched half a dozen people, and yet uh, that's just punching, like the the only. You know, if we were just looking at people you punched, it would be more than five. And he had just five people. So I just, just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Um, we're not looking just at sort of grave crimes, but we're looking at the whole of our conduct. So really, anyone should be on there uh, where one hasn't behaved appropriately where one hasn't acquitted oneself appropriately because otherwise if the name is not on there you're not going to get to examine it now there's going to be an awful lot of repetition so don't worry that putting a lot of names causes problems with having to write huge amounts it isn't because lots of things repeat so with sponsees if you have 49 sponsees you probably ill treat them all in exactly the same way you, uh, you know there might be a few quirks here and there but uh, so same with classmates or bosses or colleagues or customers. Um, so if the, even if there are lots of names, it doesn't mean there's necessarily lots of writing because most people have a limited playbook. Um, uh, so you get your list of names and then the analysis starts. Um, now, I play this one of two ways. I either get people to do the whole of the step eight first, um, and then we go on to step nine. Uh, and unless someone has got some experience of the program, I won't do that, specifically because when we start to go through the step eights together, we discover that the step eight is a dog's dinner. That's a technical term. Um, and so there's no point in people writing reams and reams and reams of stuff wrong, only to have the whole thing sent back. You might as well get them to do a little bit and um, go through that and actually start to make some amends. Because every time you make an amend, you're clearing some of the wreckage. You're making your own perception and interpretation clearer which actually helps the rest of the step eight try getting someone to trying to get someone to achieve clarity on all of their harms without having made a single amend is usually you're on a uh, you're, you're on a hiding to nothing um frankly uh because they won't be able to do it people need to get some experience of amends to get a sense of how accurate their memory is for one thing um uh Step eight needs very careful calibration. Some people need to turn the dial up and look at things more honestly and carefully. Others need to turn the dial down and not accord themselves such weighty significance in the affairs of others. And it's only by making amends that I find out whether I'm exaggerating my harm or in, actually in my case it was underestimating the harm in, my, in in almost every case i got it substantively wrong so how i harmed people was wrong nine times out of ten um and i mostly i underestimated sometimes i overestimated um 
So the experience of making amends is probably the most useful source of guidance for writing a step eight, but you've got to start somewhere. So with most people, unless they're very clear minded, I will, in which case I get them to do the whole step eight. And then we just bash through I, with someone a few weeks ago. We went through his whole step nine list in about two hours and it's just done. It's very rare, very rare that that's going to work out. Uh, because, as the big book says, maybe your husband lives in that strange world of alcoholism where everything is distorted or exaggerated. So the whole thing needs to be rewired. It's not going to happen overnight and you have to do it. It's painstaking this. So what I get people to do most of the time is say, pick a name off the list. Or maybe five names off the list. And pick the ones you anticipate are going to be the most straightforward in terms of figuring out uh, what you did wrong. Now, what most people hear is write about parents and siblings and ex-spouses and current spouses. They pick the, the five most complicated relationships first. Literally. Nine out of 10 people do that. You say, pick the simplest one. They pick their mother. You seriously think that's the simplest relationship in your life? I don't, I, I'm, I, still, I still don't understand why people literally can't hear pick the simplest one to mean pick the simplest one, but no one can. So you have to, I literally have to say to people, not your mother, not your father, not siblings, not spouses, not children got that and then two out of three still come back with the spouse or the mother I, it's it's psychotic but there we go um um anyway so you find you find some simple ones and you you work on those first and what we're doing here um is trying to nail exactly what the conduct was uh that possibly might have harmed someone. So your three columns are column one. What did I do? What did I fail to do? What did I say? What did I fail to say? So concrete, I verb object or I verb complement or I did or maybe negated. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I where it says in the 12 and 12 that uh, defective human relations are at the root of all of our problems, including our alcoholism. I think the reason for that is because most people, and it was true for me, I couldn't tell the difference between inside of me and outside of me. I couldn't tell the difference between the inside of you and the outside of you. I couldn't tell the difference between me and you. So if I thought that you were thinking something, you had literally said it. So I would imagine you were thinking something about me and it would turn into you literally said that. Um, one great example of where this, ex okay, so the first column, what did I do? And the variations. Second column, what should I have done instead? We'll come to why that's relevant in a minute. And third column, who was harmed and how? Now, with this first column, what did I do? Um, you tell people, you, you try and tell people, you say you can tell an, you can tell an alcoholic, but you can't tell them much. Um, you tell them, keep it nice and concrete. No, and, and what I tell people, I explain what abstract language is, and I explain what metaphorical language is, and I say, don't use either of those. We don't want, because if you use imagery, the person has to guess what you mean. If you use abstract language, the person has to guess what you mean. Perfect example. Uh, someone I uh, said, what, so what did you do? It was with her mother, I think. What did you do? She said, I created an atmosphere. Uh, what do you do? What do you do with that? Uh, what you want to describe in the first column is what a CCTV camera plus an audio recording device would record. What would someone who is transcribing 
uh, describe or uh, either transcribing the tape or describing what they can see on the CTC TV camera. What would they describe as going on? So other ones, I gave him a hard time. And that could mean a hundred things. I, my favorite one, this, you, you get bonus marks for this one. I didn't show her respect. What does that mean? You didn't open a door. You set fire to her hair. You stole her dog. What did you do? Oh, I don't know. That, <laughs> that's the thing that comes up. I don't know. Well, you were there. Yeah, you get to use the faculty of memory. Um, you see, you see, the story that we tell ourselves about what happened get replaces the actual memory. So, like the psychological narrative becomes the memory of what happened, and you have to peel that back to literally what did you say or do. And say or do can include um, more subtle things like tone of voice or volume of speaking. You know, it doesn't, it, it, can, it can be the manner in which we do things as much as, um, uh, 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 as much as exactly what we do. And there's sometimes a little bit of figurative language can work. So I stormed out of the room is pretty clear you're using a figurative term but we all know that there's no ambiguity there as opposed to i created an atmosphere footnote what creating an atmosphere turned out to be was scowling sighing and pausing a long time before responding whilst staring intently at the person okay <laughs> now that's clear <laughs> Sigh, what was it? You know, sighing, scowling, staring in silence. Now we've got a picture. You see, you're smiling because you can imagine that you've got the scene now. It's clear and it's concrete. Second column, what should I have done instead? Uh, most cases, it's, well, I shouldn't have done it. Um, the right thing to do is almost always self evident. Where the second column is relevant, sometimes. Uh, you see, people take as their basis for doing a step eight what I feel guilty about. So it's very common if people have uh, broken up from a, a partner of some description or broken off contact with a friend and they feel guilty about it. And uh, you say, well, first, Colin, what did I do? I and this is so you've got to be careful of language which, as they say, queers the pitch. The use of the language can obscure the truth. So you can you can actually accidentally include some moral condemnation uh, in the first column. I'll give you an example. Uh, someone might say, I ghosted Albert. Now, ghosting is a very, very specific. It was it almost psychological term for, for 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 sort of disappearing inappropriately out of someone's life? Now, what you literally did would be I stopped returning phone calls. That's the fact. Now, whether that's ghosting or whether that's let's say uh, Albert, whenever you speak to them, they just moan for half an hour and don't get a word, let you get a word in edgeways and then criticize you at the end of the call not returning phone calls is completely sane that's what you do once you've spoken to your sponsor and gone to 700 Al-Anon meetings you decide it's okay to not return the calls even though you have to go and throw up because it makes you so tense the idea of not returning the call so we've got to know well what was the right thing to have done so I you know I broke up with um I broke up with Kevin. Second column, what should I have done instead? Well, I should have broken up with Kevin. Kevin was uh, a, a gambler in relapse with his gambling, and he was spending money on my credit cards, in which case breaking up with Kevin was a very, very good idea. Uh, now, if what you did was right, i.e. the first column and the second column match, even if the other person was upset or hurt, I'm afraid hard luck. The reason being, in step nine, what you're going to go and say later on is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. It was wrong of me. And you can only say that 
if you shouldn't have done that and if it was wrong. So the second column can help tease out, particularly with people who have a, a touch of codependency and feel guilty simply because someone else is upset. Um, a, a good one thing, a good example of how if you want to manipulate a codependent, you can say something like, and I know because I've tried it, uh, you can say something like, uh, you're just not hearing me. And then the codependent will think, oh, my God, I'm committing the terrible crime of not hearing you. I've done a terrible thing. I was talking to my other half about this phenomenon of not hearing the other day. And I said, what do you think people mean when they say that they haven't been heard? He said they usually mean that their unreasonable demands haven't been met promptly. So, <laughs> no, they've heard you. They just haven't obeyed you or they disagree with you. So if so, that, so what I mean about you've got to be careful about the figurative language here because it can obscure the facts of what's going on. So this second column can help reveal, particularly to people who feel inappropriate guilt. Um, it can help people realize that what they did was right. And therefore, even though the other person often a, a drinking or using addict or acting out addict of some description, you when you have to set a boundary, they're often furious, absolutely furious, because you're no longer enabling them and, you know, writing them large checks and, and so on. Um, it can help you see that actually you don't owe amends in all of these situations where you feel guilty simply because you haven't given in to someone else's manipulation. So those are the first two columns. But honestly, with most people, in most cases, the second column is just it, it's fairly straightforward and, and it's almost redundant, really, because it's obvious that the action in the first column was inappropriate. Third column. How did the other person suffer? Um, how was the other person harmed? Uh, and I draw this very broadly. And, and it's very simple, really. Um, it, and this is why I did right from the beginning of AA, is I was asked to place myself in the other person's shoes and say, well, if I'd been treated like that, how would it have affected me? And it can affect people. The behavior can affect people in all sorts of ways. It can be physical injury. Uh, there can be um, taking someone's time, damaging their property, stealing their property, giving rise to inconvenience. Uh, nuisance is a good general heading for all sorts of behaviors, which, which fall short of actual harm, but are just incredibly annoying. Um, uh, I've already, so taking people's time, be, causing people to have to do extra work to work around you. Um, and then the emotional ones. And if, now here's the interesting. I think this is where it gets interesting. Sometimes the emotional reaction is way out of proportion to what you did. But if what you did was wrong, you're responsible. Now, you're not responsible for the extent of the emotional reaction. In fact, they are responsible for their emotional reaction. And of course, you're not really causing it, you're occasioning it somehow because they've got a pre-existing condition, as it were. But if I'm wrong, then I need to apologize, even if the stink that it created was far greater than the actual crime. And there's a, a line in a Suzanne Vega song which absolutely captures this. A careless match in a very dry field. So lots of harms turn out to be careless matches in very dry fields, that one didn't necessarily intend great harm. One was either careless or negligent or rash or something. And it, and this, this horrible chain reaction started, which dragged everyone under the bus. Um, even if the crime is small, and there was something where all I did in one of my more manipulative moments i won't tell the whole story i was in a i was in a meeting about i don't know 15 16 years ago and i was trying to work out whether the secretary who was like two or maybe gsr who was maybe two years sober wet behind the ears whether or not he was 
aware that he was going to have to handle a contentious group conscience in a week's time. And if he wasn't, I was planning to kind of shoehorn myself in to coach him on how to handle it without obviously being. I, so I was positioning myself so that he would say, oh, my God, am I taking the group conscience? I don't know what to do. Will you help me? That was the plan. So I sidled up to him. I sat down. I asked him how his day was. I asked him how his week was. Then I thought, now I'm going to go in for the kill. Um, hey, uh, have you pre uh, are you all prepared for the group to take the group conscience next week? I asked in the casualist voice I could muster. And I said, what? what do you mean? Take the group. And, and, and anyway, he promptly resigned as GSR. And uh, uh, I know, I know. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, but I was bit, I, I mean, it was very clear. It was very clear. I was being conniving and manipulative and sticking my uh, sticking my all in to the situation. I was trying to interfere. And people always know, they don't not know. So he was reacting not to the comment, but to the obvious intent behind it, which was to muscle in. Um, and it, oh God, it created the most awful stink. And then I didn't attend the group conscience in question. And that was even worse because I was the one who'd called it. And it was just a, a um, I think that the prophets call it a shit show. It was a shit show. Um, now, the actual things that I did wrong were relatively minor in themselves, but I'd start, I'd set the ball rolling. Uh, you know, those Guinness Book of World Records domino competitions where like, 20,000 dominoes all, you know, fan out in the shape of, you know, a map of Madrid or something. I'd hit the first domino. And yeah, the whole thing was set up to it. The, the thing was a powder keg. That group was a powder keg. But I let the match and threw it in. So I had to make amends to like eight people, I think. And it was all ridiculous and everyone shouted at me. <laughs> there we go. Um, so... The, 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 it does don't worry with the third column about you know whether the other person's response was reasonable or not if if you set the ball rolling you have to you have to um you have to come clean and go and, and do your best so I'm, I'm friends with all those people and as far as they're still alive i'm friends with all of them now you know the amends worked it was fine once they'd shouted at me they were fine um so there are your three columns first column what did i do second column what should i have done instead third column who suffered and how um uh now sometimes i've, I've seen this situation with a few people recently the person won't have been harmed per se um because they're uh, then just not that touchy, you know. They 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 were you know they were old they were older maybe or more mature. They they were wearing their big girls pants that day, so you know the, the um they won't have been harmed. But some kind of acknowledgement of wrong is necessary, just as a matter of etiquette. So I think those are captured as well. If so, sometimes it's simply a breach of etiquette. It, it's the person hasn't been gravely harmed just because they haven't been gravely harmed doesn't mean etiquette hasn't been breached and there doesn't need to be an apology this is particularly the case in professional situations um or in situations where people are people you're not a professional but they're dealing with you in a professional capacity they can totally handle it they've seen i remember i remember <laughs> I remember making amends to an HR human resources manager, uh, an employer, where I'd I'd been. Uh, I mean, I still think I was right in a sense. I, this contractual point, it was BS, and everyone was furious about it. It, it was it was horrible. The whole situation was horrible. It was, it was, changing our contracts and we were uh, uh, essentially it was a pay cut for work we were 
we were, which was being repackaged. But rather than just accepting this was an organi organization-wide decision and maybe there are reasons behind it and blah, 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 fine. Rather than doing that, I, I, I became, hard as it is to believe, I became vexatious. I became, I, I was a gadfly um, pecking at the barely exposed rump of the HR manager for, for over the course of several months with increasingly um, shrill and expertly worded emails with full of little barbs and sarcasms. It was really unpleasant. Um, sober, you know, not drunk, sober, whatever. Anyway, I made amends to Bernadette. I think everyone in HR at that point was called Bernadette. Uh, you, 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 you call up HR and say, can I speak to Bernadette? They'd say, which one? <laughs> I don't know. Um, anyway, I made amends to Bernadette and I said, you know, part of the form was, uh, uh, do you want to say your side of it? You know, how any of this affected you? And oh, I love HR because they can, that they know how to be completely damning in such a sort of um, gracious graceful way she said oh i was fine i've dealt with people like you before <laughs> <laughs> so i didn't harm her but it was it was necessary i i i made a nuisance of myself and i breached etiquette yeah, it was part of her job to deal with stuff like that but I breached the etiquette in terms of the way I did it it was vexatious so don't be too pernickety about the third column uh, sometimes no genuinely no one is affected and it's laughable it's just in as Tom says it's you haven't harmed anyone it's just embarrassing but if there's a whiff of someone being harmed then you go ahead with the amend. If it turns out they weren't, they'll tell you. And as one of my favourite stories, I'll finish on this. I was, uh, went to a restaurant with some friends and uh, Jonathan was supposed to come along. It was one of my favourite Jonathan lines. Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, Jonathan was, was, was at work. And so he, ca he came to the restaurant about half an hour later than, than the rest of us. And we'd ordered by then. And a couple of the people were panicked that, you know, they'd ordered and then he was arriving after they ordered this. Oh, we're so sorry we ordered without you. You know, it's really rude of us. And he said, the only insulting thing is the notion that I might be offended that you'd ordered without me because I was still at work. That's the, that's the only thing. So very often, if there was no offence, they'll tell you. And then, you know, the amend is mildly embarrassing, but it's over in 90 seconds anyway. So you... you um, in a normal amends procedure, you're not losing anything except possibly face by trying it out. So if there's a whiff that the amend is necessary, go and make it. Uh, and we'll, I mean, we'll come on another occasion to covert amends. There, are, there is such a thing as making an amend covertly, um, directly, but covertly. Um, but, but anyway, I, as far as step eight is concerned, if there is a whiff of someone being harmed, you go and make amends. So that's all I've got on step eight. So, uh, Alistair, do you want to um, skip over into questions if there are any? Yes, thank you, Tim. Um, it seems to be implicit in what you said, Tim, that, um, or rather, the, the situations you've described seem to have a human agency at both ends of them. Um, there is a person, and it reminds me of what it says... In the 12 and 12, again, sometimes useful to refer to. I think Bill described um, harms as being the, the results of instincts in collision. Um, so there's a sort of bruising, bruising going on there. Um, what I'm, what's going through my mind is, is a category of thing called um, uh, financial amends, which I've heard a lot about uh, in, in meetings. And never been terribly, never felt terribly enthusiastic about. Um, I mean, I know of people who have um, itemised every bottle of sherry that they've stolen from Marks and Spencers and then gone to Marks and Spencers and said, I, don't, I want to see the manager, I need to pay for the, pay for the sherry. 
um, and it causes all manner of difficulties um, with the accounts department because they don't know where to credit it and all the rest of it. Um, but I suppose the underlying point is, is that there's a human being at one end of that, but at the other end of the transaction, uh, you, you've got a corporation, which um, you know, arguably is not um, an entity that can have instincts that can be collided with. Um, and I suppose there's, there's a wider question there about how important it is um, to make amends to uh, yeah, it's inanimate or possibly even malicious organisations. If you've stolen from the mafia, for example, under that scenario, um, do you um, uh, then attempt to to put that thing, you know, right? And 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 what is what is right? Um, so that's a bit of a rag bag of, bag of questions. But um, maybe if I just hone that down a bit. Um, do, do, what do you think about this this category of financial amends? Is it real? Is it is it significant, or is it actually a distraction, a way of distracting ourselves from the from the real thing, which is where um, harm has been done to living, breathing human beings? Okay, that that's great. There are lots. There are actually lots of questions in there. Um, uh, when I follow the three columns, it actually takes care of that. Um, what did I do? I stole sherry from somewhere. Should I have done it? No. There we go. So certainly those two columns are without doubt. So financial, uh, whether it's stealing um, or, or, or so-called bo so borrowing um, or, or damage, um, it... As far as step eight is concerned, I'm supposed to be looking at what behaviour of mine is wrong. Um, so it's irrelevant at the point of identifying whether it's wrong, whether it's a person at the other end, a corporation, um, the nation itself, the planet, um, or, you know, the godfather himself. The, 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 the action is wrong on its own merits. So that's the first thing. So, so all of the, the uh, wrongs must be on there and financial uh, um, financial wrongs, whether it's uh, stealing or fraud or any of those. I, yeah, I absolutely, I, I certainly did it in step eight. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, I don't think I, I would have completed step eight if I hadn't written those down. Those wrongs have to be set right, I think, one way or another. Because any place which reminds me of a of a wrong that I haven't righted, it, it's as though there's a sort of pall that hangs over it. And I, I remember there was a particular employer where I'd uh, left. Um, I, I had a, an end date, but I walked out about seven or eight working days before the actual leave date over... Uh, being uh, what I thought was diddled out of a bonus. I'd been uh, induced to stay for several months after I'd given my notice on the basis that if I stayed, I'd get a particular bonus. Then the bonus day came and then I, there was no bonus and they found a technicality for not paying me and I was livid. And I, um, uh, I, my paycheck had cleared for that month. Uh, I'd effectively tied up all the loose ends. I'd done all the handovers. So the only harm by leaving uh, was denying the employer um, work in respect of the money that I'd cashed. Um, now, I think they knew they'd be naughty at the time because when I uh, stormed out in... in high dudgeon um if i put the key fob inside an envelope the key fob to get into the building i put it inside an envelope this was on the day that everyone got the bonus letter except me um i went into the finance director's office he was having a meeting with some clients so embarrassing situation um 
and on the envelope I wrote quid pro quo question mark no quid no quo um, now they didn't come after me for those seven or eight days that I didn't work that but which they paid me for and I think they recognized that the whole the whole affair was was sort of murky frankly on uh, on both well their behavior was murky and then my response was murky but I when I did make amends for that irrespective of their poor behavior towards me none of my business uh it's my behavior towards them which mattered I realized that I had been avoiding that part of London in case I ran into anyone from there. And as soon as I made the amend, this cloud lifted from over that particular, from over Leadenhall Street and Leaden, Leadenhall Market. I no longer needed to avoid Leadenhall Street and the adjacent roads. So something must be done. If I've done things wrong, something must be done with all of them. Um, now you've got three situations, I think, with uh, apart from straightforward financial amends, you know, with people you've uh, stolen or, or borrowed from and not paid back, where it's a human being and there's clearly a relation, uh, an ordinary human relation which needs to be dealt with. Uh, you, you've got three further, actually four further categories. Um, was it three or four? Anyway, you've got corporations. How do you deal with corporations? Uh, corporations and governments and local authorities. And, and so corporate entities or bodies of to some description. Um, secondly, you've got, well, do you, do you make financial amends to the nefarious? Uh, you know, whether that's uh, your example of mafia I've not come across that, but I have come across plenty of people owed money to, uh, well, well, more sort of low, low grade East London organised crime or um, drug dealers, things like that. Or indeed, I, I've met plenty of people that refuse to make amends to corporations or governments or local authorities on the grounds that they're all evil and bent anyway. So I don't I, we don't owe them anything. Um these people are quite happy to walk along a street paid for by taxpayers, but nonetheless, you know, they don't hover above it for <laughs> fear of touching the, the, the evil tarmac. Um, but that's an argument that people, people use sometimes. Uh, and I, I, I deal with the, and then you've got the, the question of um, where the, the, the sort of victim describes, where it's very difficult to identify who the amend is owed to so now this does come into the third column really who suffered and how and i think it's quite right with going to the local sainsbury's trying to sort of pay for the bottle of sherry from 1974 uh, is just going to cause problems but something needs to be done uh, now the third column actually solves this with the corporations uh, so the, the two big examples that you get an awful lot of are number one shoplifting and so all of those related things. Uh, number two, uh, benefit fraud. Uh, social security, so if you're not in the UK, social security fraud or, 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 or bending, bending the rules there. Now, although the entity with which you've been interacting is uh, faceless, as it were, and that, 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 yes, there are people who are fronting it, but they're just representatives of the organisation, they're not the organisation itself. So the local 2021 is not, has not been harmed by what someone stole from that, that branch uh, two years ago. Probably not the same manager, they're not, hasn't been personally harmed. But if stuff is stolen from a corporation, the shareholders of that corporation have suffered. And who are the shareholders? Uh, with lots of these corporations, it's people who've got their savings or their pensions or their insurance policies invested in large corporations. So it's people like my mother, whose income depends on, a uh, very modest income depends on the returns from investments, which in turn are made in Sainsbury's and Tesco's and all of these other all of these other big corporations. So there is someone who suffers at the end of it, but it's massively diluted. Um, the, so who suffered and how? It's the, sh it's the shareholders of the corporation who suffered. 
how do you make amends to the shareholders of the corporation? We'll tune in next week for that. But the the, the short version uh, is a, a very good way round this to actually get the money at least um, in the right ballpark. It's very difficult. You can't really give large corporations money. But what you can do is you can help support the local community causes that they all now support through their 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 corporate social responsibility so that you're you're as it were relieving the corporation's burden um whether or not that you know an aggregate has an effect on on the shareholders i don't know but 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 that's the closest you i think that's the closest you can get so there are ways of getting pretty close and it's a it's a similar question with um uh, where who suffered and how with benefit fraud well it's not the local benefit office the people that work there have not suffered the person who suffered is the taxpayer um a friend of mine asked around uh, just as an experiment asked a number of people if you've got if there's a bloke in aa that's now sober who defrauded it's usually housing benefit that seems to be the one that people manage to you know get the authorities on um uh if you've got someone that's defrauded the housing benefit people to the tune of ten thousand pounds do you th- uh, should they come clean giving rise to prosecution and all of the costs associated with that uh police time um uh legal assistance money the costs of the courts there are lots and lots of costs associated with that not to mention the risk of your future unemployability or reduced employability because of a criminal record or would you prefer that person to contribute to the public good to the tune of ten thousand pounds plus interest every single one who are all taxpayers who are the people who are ultimately harmed by the benefit fraud said no i would want them to contribute that money to the public good and and several of them spontaneously suggested how about housing charities if someone has defrauded the um uh, uh, uh got housing benefit well maybe they that's the way they can give back so there's a way of making it there's a way of personalizing all of this um when i've when i've done wrong I do have a relationship. It may be amorphous. It may be difficult to pin down, but it's there and something needs to be done about it. And uh, one very good example of this is uh, with, uh, and this is a very personal view. So this is not meant to be an instruction to anyone else because it's a contentious matter. But I started to get very, uh, feel very awkward about um, uh, carbon so i a few years ago i started to offset all my carbon and i i didn't just work out what it was i actually multiplied it by three and then offset that with forest planting projects uh and that changed my attitude that changed my emotional attitude towards environmental things i still believe the same things i still belong to the same party i still give money to the same causes but the uh Funnily enough, the terror went out of it. An awful lot of projection outwards of anger and rage and hatred and condemnation comes from my own repressed guilt, which I can't get rid of because it's in me for my own conduct. Unless that conduct is amended one way or another, I'm going to continue to project out. Once the guilt is gone, the projection stops. Last point, with the... um, the the ne'er do wells. Um, I think if I, I I'm speculating here. I think if I owed the mafia, I'd probably pay them off first, just not to get killed. But that will be it. That I mean, that's that's pure speculation. Uh, people disagree with this on drug dealers. Um. Uh, I didn't have drug dealers on my list, so I can't speak from experience here directly, although I've had lots of sponsees who have. Uh, I've had many sponsees who uh, have paid back their their drug dealers. Uh, uh, Very often the drug dealers are, uh, they'd be shopkeepers in another world where drugs were legal. They've got a little business, it's illicit, and 
in with my sponsors the drug dealers were just kind of ordinary local drug dealers not you know the organized crime style of drug dealers and they just paid them back i've got a, a good friend of mine who says absolutely not it's immoral to contribute to uh, a situation to return money to, into a system which causes so much harm uh and i think there are as as felix frankfurt has said there are matters on which reasonable people of goodwill disagree and i think paying back uh ne'er-do-wells uh uh, or criminals or whatever is a contentious point but the thing is i'd have to ask myself what is the principle here does that mean i only make amends to nice people in general do i have to judge each person's worth uh do i have to judge their behavior if their behavior is also bad do i not make amends it's difficult to do it, it there are ways of, of finding principles to justify that position but i th- i think it's there's a danger of legalism there um exactly how one does it with criminals as well is a matter of of um one has to approach those sorts of things very very cautiously but that's more of a step nine issue so i don't know if that goes any way to answering your questions Seamus but i think that's all i've got on on those thanks um karen you you had your hand raised and then you know was that Yes, thank you, Alistair, and thank you for hosting this, and thank you, everybody that's here. And, Tim, thank you for taking this hour out of your your day to be with us. Um, You said something at the ending, and I wanted to know what you meant for it. You were talking about direct covert amends? Yes. Can you you give an example of of what uh, you mean by that? There's a phrase, discretion is the better part of valor, which is – it's from one of the Shakespeare plays, I'm pretty sure. And, and it's one of those phrases where it's very difficult to discern the meaning from the words. But I think the, the sense is discretion is more important than valet. It's much more important to be discreet than it is to be brave. Um, there may be a cultural difference between the British and the Americans here in that... Um, I, the, the cultural stereotype, right or wrong, I know America is a big place and it's actually 11 nations, not one, um, depending on which historian you read, nine or 11, depending on the historian and where, we, you know, the historian's earlier books or the later books, that, that they, they disagree on the number of nations within America and each has its own culture. So Maine is different than New Mexico, for instance. Uh, inland Maine is different than coastal Maine. There we go. Um, uh, but Americans uh, have the stereotype of of having their heart on their sleeve, and the British uh, have the reputation of pushing everything on the carpet and being very uncomfortable with uh, anything open. Um, sometimes the bad beha- let's say the bad behaviour is. Um, ill temper and crossness and so on. The harm done, you see, this is a direct amend. What we're doing is, if possible, to amend the harm that's been done, to rectify to rectify the harm that has been done like like sewing up a fabric that's been ripped um if someone if if you're if you're being cross with someone or ill-tempered or something and the risk is that they think you're upset with them or angry with them in a sort of general way um or if you've if you've had harsh words with a friend, or even just slightly tense words with a friend, um, sure you could have some candid conversation about what happened last Thursday, but often opening up that can of worms actually leaves it create it can create a bit of a stink it can ruin that day as well and then there are more misunderstandings and then you're back at square one 
but simply resuming normal operations, being very careful and solicitous and kind and even tempered and doing something to give the person the understanding that you love them and that you care for them and that you're not angry with them and what happened has happened but it's not going to be held against you do you know what i mean there are ways there are ways of mending the harm in the relationship without having to have a sort of danielle Steele conversation about it or a barbara taylor bradford conversation about it um um so making amends directly um but it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily mean a conversation it does mean that something has to be mended now that's not i don't think that that's licensed but people will the dangerous thing of talking about this is people will seize on that say well i shall make living amends and then they don't do anything and by that they mean doing literally nothing more than they would ordinarily do but double counting ordinary everyday human behavior is making amends and then ticking step nine off the list as though something has been done when it hasn't um so that won't do either very often uh, a conversation is necessary um but also with a good an, an, a, a good example of where a covert amend is is necessary one of the principles in step nine except when to do so would injure them or others uh, one of the ways in which you can injure someone by making amends is by trying to make amends for something which they either didn't know about or sensed dimly, but had no proof of, had no verbal confirmation of. Um, and in those cases, if you were to reveal your inner landscape, uh, especially if the person has no emotional resources or resilience or maturity, emotional maturity or emotional intelligence or wisdom or any of those things, they simply wouldn't be able to process your revealed in a landscape and it would sit there. I'm sure some of you have got relatives who remember what was said in 1974 and shall never, ever forget it. So one must be very careful about saying things and amends, which are new. One should I, I think I only have an overt conversation about what was overt and not to. Re so there you're going to be making amends directly by showing kindness and show, going massively above and beyond what you would normally do in order to mend the harm. But without saying a word about what you're doing or why you're doing it. Uh, so that's a direct but covert amend. So uh, the directness of the amend is more important than whether it's overt or covert. But there has to be something which goes above and beyond what is required of you just as an ordinary human being. So that's my answer to that. Thanks, Tim. Does anyone else have any questions for Tim? Hi, everyone. Dan Alcolic. Dan. Uh, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I had... Uh, a question on so the first day of senior school i had a punch up with a, another kid and um we went on to become friends in school and i don't ever remember there being uh an apology between us or anything but we it was like it didn't happen right it was just sort of accepted as a you know a rite of passage or whatever it was but there was no animosity and we were friends until we left school so with something like that Obviously, there was a situation there, and if that would have went the other way and I would have been, you know, sworn enemy, then that would be a different story. But if you turn into friends, do you think that that requires an amend or that's a... Yeah, it's a really, really, that's a brilliant example, because that's a perfect example of the situation where column one, what did you do? I punched him in the face. Column two, what should I have done? Said, not punched him in the face. Third column, who suffered and how? No one. Because it was, there's a thing that doctors used to write in medical records in Norfolk, which is famed for having people with a slightly unusual genetic profile, rightly or wrongly thought. I mean, I don't know. I'm not from Norfolk. They, doctors would literally write NFN, normal for Norwich, or normal for Norfolk. And... <laughs> <laughs> so things which anywhere else would require explanation they just we're just not even going to go there so there are lots of things where what is right or wrong whether someone was harmed or not will depend on the social setting 
So there are business practices which in one field would be a, would be disciplinary offences or grounds for legal claims, but which in other sketchier areas of business, for instance, nightclub promotion, um, where the pra certain practices fly where they wouldn't somewhere else. So I think it, that's why the third column, who suffered and how, is so important. And there are two ways of coming at the third column, either speculating as to what happened. You know, if I had been in that position, how would I how would I have felt? Or simply looking at the evidence. Is there any actual real world evidence that anything was worse? Anyone was worse off on any level as a result of this? Is there anything to indicate that anyone was harmed? And what you're telling me with that situation is there was no indication that anything was harmed. Similarly, if maybe there was, but it's blown over and it's been forgiven and forgotten and just chalked up. And my old sponsor, Brian, would say all is fair in love and war. There are some things where the, a certain amount of rough and tumble is par for the course, is normal in certain types of relationships, certain types of environment in the city, which I've worked in, uh, where people were very rough with each other uh, in a way that you couldn't get away with now in most work environments. But it was normal for how those city firms operated 25, 28 years ago. So you just you just sort of sucked it up and you, you, you toughened up. And that was just part of the deal. So a lot of it is contextual. What, what's the social context? Where is it? What, 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 what's the domain of life? What's the social context? Who were the people involved? Were they actually affected? So it, the third column actually can bring up some really interesting uh, information. One tiny thing. There's one tiny thing. Sometimes you get super complicated situations. And what you get people to do, I'll keep this really brief. What you get people to do is to write a little dramatis persona at the top. Who's who? names and roles and then the events that occurred in the order that they incur occurred with no analysis just this is what happened then this happened then this happened then this happened with your contribution highlighted and with each contribution was that right or wrong was that right or wrong was that right or wrong and then you find out what the harm what the aha so it was at you were fine up until you tore up the plane ticket. That was the thing that you did wrong. Uh, but sometimes you need to get it out. You need to get the pe the whole array of characters first and then the events in chronological order, and then you can make head or tail of it. So that's a helpful way to help people untangle tricky situations. I'd like to hand back to Tim to uh, close with Serenity Prayer. Please feel free to unmute if you uh, care to. To set the tone for this meeting, I will read an extract uh, from Chapter 1, Bill's Story, page 13. Um, my schoolmate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. We made a list of people I had hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals, admitting my wrongs. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. The topic of tonight's meeting is working step nine with a sponsee. And Tim uh, will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic, after which the floor will be open for questions rather than the typical sharing. And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Hi, uh, Tim, I'll call it. Can you hear me all right, Alistair? Yeah, good. So I haven't drunk since last week, which is a very good thing. So I must be doing something right. Not even beer. Um, so by the time you've got your little sponsee to step nine, they've either completed their step eight list or they've had they've made a start on it and they've processed enough amends, um, enough step eights to be able to start making amends. As I said last week, um, uh, a bit of insight and reality really helps in step eight. And a lot of that insight and reality comes in step nine. So uh, 
it can really help with a lot of people to get them to do a few amends before completing everything in step eight. Uh, there, there may be a willingness in principle to make amends to everyone. Of course, that must be there. But uh, in terms of the detailed processing of these relationships, uh, the reality, the, the contact with reality in step nine is immensely helpful and it's much quicker to get people to get some experience of step nine first and then start to look at the rest of the detail in step eight. So we're now at the position of starting to make amends and I get people to um, go through their pile. Let's say you've got a pile of amends to make. You go through the pile and you assess each one on with reference to two criteria. In the first one, am I able to make this amend and this means you're clear you're clear on what to say uh where they are how to contact them it's all tickety boo uh and willingness means you're being you're internally prepared to if someone handed them the, you, the handed you the phone would you be willing to make the call right now and to go through and to so to sort all of the step eights in the pile between ones you're able to do, ones you're not able to do, ones you're willing to do, ones you're not willing to do. And to, to start with the ones where you're willing and able. And the reason to do this, there's no point in hitting yourself over the head with amends where you feel unable or you think you're unable for some reason or you're unwilling. If you make the ones where you're able and willing, you'll find all sorts of amends appear now to be within grasp in terms of either understanding what to do or being internally prepared to do it. So, so pick the low-hanging fruit first. If you're cleaning, clearing a cupboard, you clear the items at the front first. You don't reach past them and try and scrabble things from the back. So start with the easiest ones or what you think are going to be the easiest ones. Um, and what I get people to do is to do a mental walkthrough of the amend. So how they're going to approach the person, what they're going to say, what um, spirit they're going to do it in, how much detail to go into. And a lot of questions come out of this. And often people think they're unwilling. And they're not unwilling. It's just they anticipate problems arising, very specific problems arising, if they make the amend as they're anticipating to do it. And those are very often legitimate and need to be dealt with. And so the answer there is not to work on willingness and to pray for willingness, but to look at what the concrete objections are, to work through those. And then you suddenly discover you're willing. So they do a, a, a walk through. Now, I'm going to be terribly rude about speaker tapes. I hope you don't mind. Uh, there, there's rather a sort of a, a disagreeable tone that people sometimes take in speaker tapes on step nine. Uh, a little bit sarcastic when they talk about their relationship with their sponsor. And they say, well, I went to my sponsor and said, well, can I make this amend over the phone? And the sponsor says, well, did you harm them over the phone? Ha, 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 ha. Uh, uh, and you've got to, you know, if you if you it says made amends directly. So and it doesn't count. I've heard people say it doesn't count unless it's physically in front of them. Um, now, I'm not going to go into detail why that's all uh, deeply unhelpful. Uh, but I'm going to say what is helpful. First of all, let's look at what it says in step, steps eight and nine. It talks about making direct amends. What that means very clearly from the literature, given that in the step nine reading in the big book, it talks about writing letters to people. What it means is you somehow address the topic with the person rather than just generally trying to be a nicer chap or chapess. So uh, direct means to the person, not uh, with the universe in general. 
the phrase in person was available in 1939, but was not chosen. If what was meant was in person, they would have said in person. Uh, so direct means you're dealing with it, with the situation with the person. Now, the question of mode, uh, so the mode of communication is relevant here. Uh, and there are all sorts of different categories. So I walk people through these. First of all, you've got people you're seeing on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a regular basis. And with those, because you're seeing them the whole time anyway, you might as well just grab them when you see them, say, you know, Susan, do you have five minutes? And approach them that way because they're used to interacting with you. But frankly, a lot of people that I had to make amends to, well, I wasn't a very nice person when I was drinking. I wasn't particularly mean except when I was trying to be funny, but I was n horribly negligent with people and they were having none of it. They didn't want anything to do with me. And the last thing that would have been right to do with these people is to insist on a personal audience with them uh, uh, as though, you know, I, I, I'm in a position to command such a thing. And I'm absolutely not. What it talks about in the book, which is at the reference point, is tact and consideration. And on page 90, there's a brilliant line. It says, and it's on step 12, but it's pertinent to step nine. It says, you put yourself in their shoes and say, how would you like to be approached if the tables were turned? And a, a number of people have very kindly made amends to me in AA over the years. Uh, none of them needed to, but um, they, 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 I showed up on their step eight list so that they wanted to make amends. And well, what did I want as someone who is an amendee? Most of all, I wanted the process to be over as quickly as possible. And the phone would do. A text message is frankly good enough. I just, a little acknowledgement that you were wrong doesn't go amiss. But really, I don't want, you know, people have phoned up and said, hey, like people I barely know. Say, hey, do you want to meet for a coffee? No. No, I don't want to meet for a coffee. I'm not sure who you are. <laughs> and also, like, I don't have enough time to have coffee with some of my best friends. So, no, I did. Can we, what, what do you, and then it turns out, oh, they want to make amends. Fine. So, um, or will you be at this meeting or will you be, no, no, no. What you do, you say to the person, I would like to make amends. Uh, uh, I would like to make amends to you. You don't go in with, let's have a coffee, let's go for dinner. You, you up front, first out of the gate, you say, I would like, I've treated you badly. I would like to make amends to you. Ideally, I'd love to be able to see you face to face. I totally get you won't have the time or even necessarily the inclination. So I'm going to put it in your hands, you know, um, face to face, video call, telephone call, WhatsApp message, Raven, skywriting, you pick, you pick. It's the person that is being made amends to that gets to pick the mode. Uh, I don't have, absolutely don't have the right to insist here. Now, as I said, we've got two types of people here. People we're in regular contact with, uh, and who we see the whole time, and then people we've lost contact with. Uh, I've already dealt with the people we're in regular contact with. The ones that we're not must be approached. The initial approach must be uh, in writing. Occasionally, a phone call will be appropriate. I don't know about you. I don't like phone calls out of the blue, particularly. I'm always in the middle of something. And if some if it's a phone call out of the blue from someone I haven't spoken to for, for years, my defences go up. Yeah, I had a slightly tricky childhood. My defences go up. I'm like, what's going on here? It's not my ideal mode of contact. And a lot of people are like this. Maybe it's a British thing. I don't know. Um, 
you know, maybe we'd all prefer just for people to take out adverts in the Times if they want to contact us, you know, that might be the best way. Um, so I approach people in writing, I get people to do the same. So, so uh, and it's, it's basically a sort of two move maneuver. So the first move is the approach in writing uh, to say, I would like to make amends. Here are the options. Uh, I'll uh, wait to hear from you. And then if I don't hear from you within a couple of weeks, I'm going to send you a letter on whatever the channel is. If it's WhatsApp on WhatsApp, if it's on Messenger on Messenger, if it's email by email, I'm going to send you an amend contained in a document and you can read that or you can just delete it. The marvelous thing about this is uh, there, is, there have been some, some uh, tricky people in my life. Uh, now, none of them have made amends to me, and I don't need them to. It's fine. But, but, but if they were to, I'm not sure I would want to read a letter, even with some of them. As I wouldn't necessarily, I'd think very carefully before reading material from certain people. Uh, I don't know if you've ever received an email or a letter and four lines in, you know, you should delete it straight away and you wish you hadn't read those first three or four lines. Just the first three or four lines totally set you off. So. The, the brilliance of this approach, which was given to me, so I pass it on to other people, is if you're warning them that the next communication is going to contain the amend letter with all of the tricky stuff in it, it gives them the option to delete it without reading it and without discovering any of the content. And also, if you're warning them that you're going to give it two weeks and then send it, it saves you having to pester them. It means there's a maximum of two communications and then you're done. A lot of people just don't want to be heard. Uh, they, they don't want to be contacted. Message can be an intrusion. Uh, uh, two, as long as you've warned with the first, it's going to be fine. Now, back to this in-person business. Frankly, ideally... From, despite what I've said, ideally, uh, uh, in person is great. So if communication takes place um, in person, which doesn't take place in other channels. So it's good to lead with that. I would love to meet you. But I have to say, there are lots of situations where other modes can actually be better. And it's very interesting. There's a Course in Miracles teacher in America who does one-to-one -one sessions. And he, I don't know if he, what his position is now. Historically, he would only do, this was over Skype, so before the whole age of Aquarius or Zoom or whatever. Um, on Skype, he, he would only do audio calls. He wouldn't do video calls. He said, the video is distracting you hear a lot more what's going on in people's voice over the phone. There's more communication over the phone than face to face. Very interesting. I think there's a lot in that. So um, uh, by letter as well. Um, I suggest to a lot of people that they put the amend sometimes to put the amend in a letter but in the letter say i would love to meet to discuss further now what this is doing is it's opening the door if the other person wants to uh make to, to, to be spoken to face to face to have a discussion it's opening the door to that but um i don't know if you've ever had conversations with tricky people where you're very clear before the conversation begins what you want to say. But as soon as you start speaking, they take over and take the conversation in another direction. And even if you manage to say, like physically, you know, pronounce the words you want to say, the other person is already set off. They're already in their own little fantasy world and they're not going to hear it anyway. So the point, the point of a 
is not the form. So if you've said the words in person, you've done the job, no. The job is to communicate. The question is, which mode is going to communicate most effectively? Uh, letters can be extremely intimate forms of communication. They are not necessarily avoidant. Sometimes the avoidant thing to do is to have the face-to-face -face conversation. Uh, whereas putting it in black and white, uh, it, it, it also, when it's in writing, it gives the endeavour a sense of gravity, your gravitas. You're pinning your colours to the mast. So it's a very brave thing. To, it's braver sometimes to do it in writing because they can show the letter to someone. Whereas if you have a conversation with someone, if they report it to someone, the person will think, well, maybe they said that, maybe they didn't. I wasn't there. So it's a very brave thing to put it in writing. Uh, it has a, a tone of formality. Uh, it means I'm serious about what I'm doing here. So there are all sorts of advantages to doing it in writing, and it's absolutely not to preclude a phone call, a video call, a face to face conversation, a meeting. If they jump, you say how high. But it's getting the message across. If you do it in writing, you can be very sure that you're wording it correctly. I'm not going to name any names, but I'm in conversation with someone at the moment that is needing to apologize to various people in their life uh for some some events shall we say and i've said to him uh start off in writing um and it's all gone terribly well so far so that the, the method is working uh start off in writing but i want you to send me i want you to send me the draft whatsapp message before you send it and i get the first draft I, oh Jesus, you can't say that. And it gets reworded and sent back. And it, all the ones which have gone out have gone down. I think they've gone down. There's one I haven't heard back about. But they all seem to have gone down very well. Point being, um, unless someone is a very good actor and learning lines, they're, they're, who knows what you're going to say in the heat of the moment? Things can come. Have you ever had something come out wrong? I have. Whereas when it's in writing, you can put it past someone else and they can, they can suck their teeth. They, I wouldn't say that. So you can make sure that it, you're absolutely communicating what you want to communicate. And a second reason why a lot of amends need to be in writing. Have you ever had a WhatsApp, a WhatsApp conversation with someone where you say something and then the other person reacts in a WhatsApp message and you look at the reaction and you're like, did you even read what I said? And you go back and you say, oh, can you reread what I said? I think you may have misread it. And they go, oh, I'm so sorry. You're, you're totally right. Now, if that's an oral conversation, have you ever tried to say, no, you misheard what I said or you miss? They said, no, I didn't. I know. I know what you said. I know what I heard. So uh, and then all hell breaks loose. So if there is a miss, if you've got someone who is prone to hearing things their own way, do not have a conversation unless it's absolutely unavoidable. Put it in writing because they can read it and reread it and reread it and show it to their friend Sally. And Sally can say, actually, I think that's a pretty reasonable message. <laughs> I just that they've at least got if they want to look at it sanely, they've got the evidence in front of them. If it's an oral conversation, the way it goes into their memory is their first interpretation of what you said. It is not the words that you said. So even if they try and process the conversation afterwards with a friend, they won't be reporting accurately what the amending person said. So in writing is a super way to do it. Uh, 
as I say, is not to preclude some sort of face to face, but you want to edge back into people's lives, not launch on some self-important expedition, knocking on the door without knocking on the door without warning. Um, until people are confident with their uh, amends approaches, the written approach, and then maybe the written amend, if, if the written amend is going to be the beginning of the conversation with the person, uh, I get people to run all of those past me until they're kind of, it's like things in the washing machine until until the water's running clear, until the clothes are coming out clean. If there's any sense that things are going off tangent, on a tangent, then absolutely, you know, bring them back again and again and again. Um, because it's bad enough to get the harm to do the harm. It's doubly injurious to get the apology wrong. And I can tell you, in my life, in the people around me, I see people more upset by bodged apologies and amends than by the original offence. Uh, people are pretty forgiving about things done in haste or passion or in reaction, but badly thought through amends. Ugh. And in particular, um, when you're getting someone to do the walkthrough and particularly when they're, if you're reading the message, what you want to do for your sponsee is put yourself in the shoes of the person who is going to hear the amend or read the amend and say, if you were that person and you were really suspicious and difficult and having a bad day, what would you, wh what would you find wrong with this? What would, if you were just, that th there's a, there was a sketch many years ago where uh, someone is in a restaurant and the waiter deliberately misconstrues everything that the uh, diner says. And uh, so the, for instance, the, the, uh, the diner will say, uh, does the chicken come with vegetables? And the waiter says, it doesn't come we bring it. And so what and the whole conversation is like that. So you read the amend letter as though you're like as though you're that waiter, as though you're just the most difficult person, difficult and touchy and prone to reading things into statements. So you want to read it from that point of view. And if you do it like that, if you imagine yourself at your worst, then you'll pro uh, what again, you want it to be rewritten and rewritten until you would not be able to find a problem with it as the recipient, legitimately find a problem with it as the recipient. And that's a really good way of, a really good way of doing it. But you're also testing against the three principles of step nine, the accept when to do so would injure them or others. Don't reveal new information unless the new information reduces the injury um don't uh involve a third party without their permission and don't take any action which is going to uh, impair your ability to be useful but with the new information uh occasionally there are situations where new information reveals an action to be far more innocent than it was thought to be at the time. And that can be helpful. But the danger of going into any explanations about why the bad thing happened is as soon as you're explaining it, you're pointing the finger away from you towards the explanatory circumstances. So, well, it wasn't really me that said the bad thing or did the bad thing. It was the bad day that I was having. That's the real culprit here. And you, that nothing aggravates amendees more than unwanted and unnecessary explanations. What people want to hear is generally is this. Um, I should, I did X, Y, and Z. It's taken me far too long to apologize for this. I was wrong for doing it. I regret doing it. I would like to make things right with you. How can I do that? Uh, Anyone that does want to know all the gory details of 
the person's state of mind at the time is probably not a good person to share that stuff with anyway. <laughs> Why do they care? Usually it's because what some people are very intrusive at receiving amends or if they're in, intrusive back in relation to the person making the amends, it's usually because they're minded to retain the grievance and they want more ammunition and you don't want to give them the ammunition. Um, uh, so to, to, to watch out for it when reading the draft amends. Now, if someone is going to, even when someone is going to make an amend face to face, I get people to write out what they're going to say and read it out. And again, all sorts of stuff comes out when they read it out. You think you can't say this, you can't say that. And in general, the whole thing gets compressed down. The one thing people need training on as well uh, is how to write a letter. Um, in other words, how to top and tail the letter, how to top the tail, top and tail the amend. Um, Sometimes people's first draft amend letters um, are like, it's like opening an, a door and an elephant charges through the door. Like you're just not expecting what's coming and boom, and then it's all gone. It's like within two lines, the whole thing is over. Bye. Um, and so the letter has to be topped and tailed with some kind of introduction like, um, uh, you know, it's been many years since we've spoken my approach to you may not be entirely welcome but i've got a legitimate reason for contacting you um uh in the past i treated you very badly and i'd like to set things right and and specifically the details of this are as follows and at the end you know um uh i, I hope uh, uh i hope there is some way i can make this right i'm available for contact on the following details if there, if there's anything you would like to add if i've i've done my best to analyze the past if i've missed anything uh 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 you know feel free to let me know because i can be very dense about my own behavior i can miss even very major things so i've done my best but i i know that often falls short so so please feel free to tell me anything else i've done and if i don't hear from you i quite understand a lot of people will not want to respond to a letter like this. In any case, I wish you well in your future endeavours. So nicely topped and tailed. Um, this, again, gives it a sense of gravitas. There's nothing worse for amendees, especially if they're savvy about 12-step recovery. A friend of mine made an amends to a bloke in AA. It's always the worst. Oh, You'd think, you'd think people in AA would be great at receiving amends. I'm reasonably gracious these days. I'm brisk, but gracious. Uh, but some people are mean, just. So my friend made amends to someone and they said, oh, you're making amends. I see at last. What am I? Number 37 on the list. So it, it, it mustn't seem like a dead exercise. It's got to have some humanity to it and something personal to it. So that's got to be in there as well. These are very, very difficult things to do. And people can't do this on their own. They need a lot of handholding with this. And they get better during the process, usually, usually by the end, that they're, they're pretty much You've heard of the self-basting chicken. Well, most people are self-basting chickens by the end of the process, but not everyone is. People come in with different degrees of damage in AA, and that's fine, and we have to work with that. Um, with the money, I'm going to say one thing about the, the money. So we touched on the money situation last week. What I get people to do is... Uh, tot up all of the financial amends and these or schedule them out somehow and these fall into three categories number one legal debts debts which if not paid will legitimize someone making a claim against you through the courts or um, a collection agency coming and taking your flat screen or your 
pug or something. Um, uh, so legal debts. Second category um, is debts which people know about, but they're not really legal debts. So friends and family or uh, debts where as far as they're concerned, it's written or you haven't paid it back. But as far as they're concerned, it's it's um, water under the bridge and they're not going to come after you for it in any way. The third category is debts which no one knows about. Now, um, there isn't a sort of standard algorithm for this, but you you want people to, to they need to know the worst of the financial ones before they even uh, start to let people know they're paying back money or start to pay back the money. Because the last thing you want to do is for them to sort of pay, you know, £10,000 back to their Auntie Janice, who isn't even asking for it, whilst the bailiffs are knocking on the door and the children haven't got anything to eat. So you, 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 you've got to look at the legal debts first, basically. And the best way to do this uh, is you point people in the direction of debt consolidation agencies and similar. And, and uh, find a way to get everything consolidate, consolidated into a single affordable monthly payment. Most of those are corporate. So although it has to be paid back, it, the pain... Uh, that it, it affects individuals at the end of a chain, but they don't feel the pain the same way that individuals, friends and family do. So although it needs to be dealt with very urgently, it's not necessarily what you want to pay off entirely first. You want that to be on a reasonably long tail whilst you deal with category B. So you get the 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 the, the, the the courts and the collection agencies and the banks and the credit card companies off your back for uh, off your back first and then you can breathe then you've got time to consider the other things carefully um if there are any particular egregious financial um amends uh, or financial harms which require particularly urgent do need to be addressed very very quickly then obviously they get those go to the top but a very good way of doing the financial amends with the second tier with the friends and family and acquaintances and so on is to work out the total work out the monthly payment you can make without making yourself destitute but nonetheless making it hurt and then you divide that proportionately across all of them so you can contact all of them at once because i don't think it's right to make to, to to be the one to decide to make certain people wait there are exceptions to this there's a very very there's you know there are endless variations of this so one there are these are general principles um when all of the friends and family and acquaintances are paid off then you're going to have that freeze up your finances and then you can accelerate the payments to all the corporate ones and start hacking down the list of uh, ones that they don't know about. Um, anyone who uh, rejects the finance, the, re the, the repayment, um, then uh, the amount still needs to go out of my pockets. This is what I did. Um, I would ask the person to nominate a charity. And then that goes on the third list, the list of ones which who, who are not expecting the money, because obviously you don't want to be paying money to a charity which is not expecting it or needing it or wanting it right now, whilst your auntie Janice is waiting for her money back, uh, because that's going to affect your relationship with auntie Janice, the charity, it's arm's length. So, uh, but something needs to be done because, and the principle is it's not my money. Uh, the other thing you need to help people do, because most people, will not think of this and if they think of it they won't know how to do it to go to a website where you just google something like what is a hundred pounds in 1971 worth now and to add inflation into it so whatever you're paying back now reflects the change in value of money over time um and say so one thing about uh, uh living amends uh, i'm 
slightly allergic to the term because often the notion of living amends is used uh, or rather such living amends are used as a substitute for having a conversation with anyone at all. Now, there are situations where the conversation can't be had for a myriad of reasons, and one has to revert to this rather indirect way of making things up to people. Um, but my take is uh, step nine is completed when you have made all of the approaches and had all of the conversations that you can have. After that point, there may be follow up requested by the other person, uh, and that could be a lifelong thing. Now, it, one mustn't feel that one's under some lifelong burden. It should be a lifelong um, privilege, frankly, to, to be able to do something good in return for all, all of the harm that one has done. But one mustn't see it as that one hasn't completed step nine. So with those follow throughs, what one can be is permanently current. You can be current with the payments. You can be current with the other follow through actions. So you don't feel as though you're constantly paying a debt. Because I don't think that's that's right. I, I think your, your debt is paid morally when you're current as of today. Um, as to sort of behaving well with people, the long period of reconstruction it talks about in page on page 83. I think one's supposed to be doing that in step 12 anyway, practicing these principles in all our affairs. So I think it's already covered in step 12. The danger, and this is very commonly done in the UK, I think it's changing last few years, but historically, people will basically not make amends and then say, well, I'm making living amends. And by that, they meant not being a jerk on a daily basis, which is already covered. So you're taking step 12, the not being a jerk bit of step 12, and then you're double counting it and saying, well, that's also my step nine. So, hey, I've done two steps at once just by being a normal person. And I don't think that will do in most cases. Um, uh, oh, last thing. Uh, the, on some American tapes, uh, it's very common for people to say to, for it to be suggested to say to someone, uh, what can I do to make this right? Uh, um, or something to that effect. Um, I think one's got to be careful with that. To say that to people who are morally and psychologically sound. Because if you say that to people who are not morally and psychologically sound, and then you have to not do what they've asked, you've now caused a further harm. So one must be extremely cautious about that and deploy that tactic with only with people where it's reasonable to do so. So I think that's all the basic stuff on step nine. Um, so, Alistair, I don't know if you want to go over to questions now. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, as uh, Tim mentioned, this uh, meeting, the meeting is now open for questions. Angus. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Tim. How do you deal with amends to people that are no longer living? Dead? Okay, so this is, this is standard procedure. Uh, you write a letter as if they're still alive. You find an old person in AA, that's someone my age or older, to hear you read out the letter. Um, preferably someone that, ha but it has to be someone that's basically completed all their amends themselves, understands this process, someone kosher. You, you, you can't go to just anyone. You've got to be careful with this because it, it can set people off like firecrackers. If they haven't made their amends or if there are any amends they haven't made, they will react badly to you wanting to do this with them. Um, but, you know, what one tends to find over the years, you know, people in, in recovery who've been sober a long time, people in their 60s, people in their 70s. I don't know why the age thing makes a difference. It's like reading things to your grandparents. They can be a sort of safe uh, recipient so you read it to them um, and it's as though the person is standing in the stead of the person you're making amends to I, it gets termed by some people a proxy amends uh, the other thing you can do and this is a, an and or uh, is 
to uh, write a letter and go to a place which is significant for you and them and your relationship or significant to them or somehow reminiscent of them. So a friend of mine was making amends to someone who's Dutch, who he had known in America or I think in America and, and somewhere in the Caribbean. And when he went to, to make amends, the chap had died and uh, he went to the Dutch church um, in London, which is a lovely church, by the way, if, if you're ever in, in that part of town. Lovely. Uh, they often have exhibitions in there. Um, but he went in there and he made he, he read out the letter. He had a very powerful experience. And the third thing you can do, you can say, right, God, I need to make amends for this. Uh, I will need to make indirect amends to the universe somehow. Uh, you show me how. And I'll give you one example of where this, the, it's not just dead people. Sometimes you can't find the person because you don't have enough of a name to go on. And there was a chap from Cardiff who I, when I was 15, I treated very, very badly. I met him on a, on a orchestra course. Uh, I've never been able to trace him. A very sort of, uh, very, very common name. And I'd never been able to trace him. Uh, and I did my absolute best. I try, I've tried repeatedly. He's on the sort of list of can't finds. Um, and I pushed the whole thing up to my higher power. And then through a curious set of coincidences, uh, someone in AA in Cardiff uh, who knew a friend of a friend called me and said, look, I've got a problem that I need to talk to someone about from my childhood. Um, and he was, he was still very upset about a particular thing that had happened when he was 14 or 15. Now, it, the story is not going to be, oh, and it was the same kid. No, it wasn't the same kid. Just in case you want one of those, you know, podium endings. Uh, it wasn't. But the point is, I was able to help him through his to process what had happened to him at that age. And that's maybe as close as I can get to making amends in that particular case. Maybe it'd be too incendiary for me to uh, make amends directly to that person, which is why I haven't been able to find him. Who knows what the universe is doing there? But you will be offered an opportunity by the universe to make amends, to, to redress the balance, to settle the accounts with the universe. If you keep, if you're willing and you keep your eyes peeled and your ears, if you can peel ears, I'm not sure if you can peel ears, but you know what I mean? You, you pay attention and the universe will provide you with an opportunity. Thanks, Tim. Harry, you have a question. Hey, everyone, I'm Harry, I'm an alcoholic. Thanks, Tim. Um, so on the phrase you just used, settle the, uh, settle the uh, score with the universe. Um, so I understood that I, in my mind, I have the amends as an expression of regret, sorry, plus an attempt to put something right. So I've stolen the money, I'm going to repay the money. I've, I've drunk your wine, I'm off to repay that, you know, I'm going to replace the thing I took, took and so on. But on emotional harm, when I've been a real terror with someone, um, so most of most of the people I went out to were in that category. I've just been incredibly unpleasant and rude, and I, you know. And for most of them, I did actually say, "Is there anything I could do to put it right?" And maybe in some cases that was mis misjudged. And almost no one took me up on it. No one said, "Oh well, you can wash the car to make up for you being rude." But a couple of people who I'd been incredibly unpleasant to expected, as a result of my amends, that we were now going to be besties. And that we, I would be making amends by now being their friend, for example. Um, so I wondered if is is the is the apology and the sincerity of of coming out to someone the putting right itself? Like I've given the opportunity to forgive me. Now I'm straight with the universe. Or is there something I go beyond to do to put the emotional harm right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think this goes to what the one of the core difficulties of amends, which is most things you can't put right per se. So emotional suffering can't be uh, reversed, uh, except on occasion. I mean, that there is such a thing as healing, and uh, often 
the other person's acknowledgement of what they did wrong is the missing ingredient which permits the person to heal. But the problem, it's as though that the real harm is not the emotion at the time. It's the sticking of that emotion in their craw. Um, and what the amend does is it removes that little bit of grit stuck in the craw so that everything can flow again. Uh, I can't tell you how often I've seen situations where someone said, I don't care. I just need them to admit they were wrong. And then, then we're good. Then we, because it's a matter of etiquette if there's been some very bad behavior. Um, with old friends, I'm sure there's a Sondheim song about this somewhere. With old friends, yeah, there is the most, the, there is the most frightful risk of being lumbered with some crazy person because, you know, you've made amends to them. Now you've, you know, you've really opened the door. Um, I think it's wise to scan your amends for high risk individuals and to make sure that those amends are done with the greatest possible formality. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is true with a lot of exes that in order to avoid, one must make amends to the exes somehow, um, I, th I believe, uh, as long as it fulfills all the criteria in eight and nine. Uh, but one mustn't make amends in such a way that you cause, you know, a flare up of their, you know, romantic gout. And, you know, you set them off for another six months because that can happen. So one must be sort of very Jane Austen about certain types of amends in order. Uh, uh, and also um, some people actually say in the amends, my sole purpose here is not to reinitiate a friendship or try to recapture the past or to try to launch us on a new adventure. I simply want to set right the past. And, you know, at the end of the letter, and I wish you I wish you well in all your future endeavours, which may... By the way, I mean, you know, the way the English always means something else by what they're saying. What that means is I never want to hear from you again. I wish you well in all your it, it seems so nice <laughs> and it is, but it's a very clear boundary as well. It means we're not going to be chatting much. There might be a couple more exchanges, but we're pretty much done here. So I think uh, as long as one's wary of that, um, I think it all comes under the, the, the category of with, a, with emotionally tricky people, then you, you have to be especially careful in terms of tact and consideration, how you're making the amends. So I don't know if that helps. Oh, by the way, just one, one thing on people reacting badly. Um, yeah, again, as, if, if you're like, my, I was so unpleasant and difficult. Um, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to have anything to do with me uh, after none, none of my first round of amends resulted in you know being cozy with anyone again but i was cordial with afterwards which is about as good as i can get so there we go anything else thanks tim uh, seamus hello everyone can you hear me good yes uh, thank you so much for that Tim, I mean, it, it chimes with a lot of what I've come to believe. It was nice to have have those instincts confirmed. Um, where does, how do I frame this as a question? Um, starting with the text in the, in, in, in the big book, so it has a lot to say um, on step nine, m more, I think, than virtually anything else. Um, and you've got this series of, uh, of case studies there, which... Um, I think you know round here, good old fashioned AA um, was when I first came around was regarded as you know you've got to be kidding. <laughs> um, might have applied in 1930s America, but um, not really relevant um, right here, right now. But connected with, I think there's a kind of immediacy to it that that everything in the big book is described as being is happening very quickly. It's in the white heat of recovery. 
Um, and that wasn't the way it was around here. I mean, I myself didn't get to step four until I was about three years sober. Um, when I did get there, I, I, I did the work fairly quickly, but it was a bit patchy. Um, and I did it um, mainly because the sponsor I was working with at the time was about to leave the country. I didn't want to start again with somebody else. So when he did leave the country and became severely unwell, I was kind of stuck on the cusp of the cusp of step eight. I had the list um, and I had done, I did the, did the analysis, but the actual execution of, um, of step nine w- was, was rather hit and miss. Um, I'm a flying by the seat of my pants. Um, the results of that were actually surprisingly good, um, which makes me think that maybe one shouldn't overplan these things. In the main, people were presented to me and my responsibility was not to duck, duck the opportunity when it came. I needed to rise the challenge. I needed to know what I'd done so that I could um, be sort of nimble on my feet and say, look, you know, I was an arsehole. I'm really sorry. I hope, hope I won't, yeah. won't be doing that again. Uh, and in the main, that went quite well. But after about seven years or so, I was back in the doldrums. I was back on page 52. I knew I needed to do a retread on all the steps. And I suppose my question is, when it's no longer in the white heat, but you're doing a retread, perhaps 10 years after the event, okay, there'll be some new ones, some new offences that have been caused. It certainly were in my case, actually, but also some festering things from the first time around. Um, what does that mean? It, is it a good idea you know, to dig up old bodies that may be sort of well decomposed um, and, uh, and expose them to the... Um, to the light of the day. I mean, in, in my case, some of these people had actually died. In some, some of my loose ends were people who had been alive, if I addressed it quickly enough. But by the time I, you know, finally got around to it, they, they, were, they were dead. Um, so what, to, to wrap all that up, so what, what, con, what considerations apply? What variations, if any, might apply um, when you're coming back to it um, 10 years after the event? You haven't been drinking, but you may have been an arsehole. Uh, once in a while um and you've got some new things and you've got some old things which remain unamended from the first time around have you got any thoughts on that yeah i do it's, uh, it's all very interesting um i think the first thing that situation is very common uh to have a rough and ready first steps eight and nine and then have to revisit the whole question later on now certainly that if the as it were, the hatchet has been buried, you leave buried hatchets buried. So if you've actually made amends to someone, no, you don't dig it up. Uh, But the thing is about the amends that haven't been made, then this is the point. There has been no funeral. The body hasn't been buried. It's decomposing in your living room, you know, between you and the television. So every time you watch Netflix, you see the pile of decomposing bodies in front of you. The point is to actually now bury them. They should have been buried a very, very long time ago. So I, I think the actually the urgency is even greater after a number of years. Um, very often people who are so, and this, this is not to talk about you because I, I, I don't know you very well at all, but it's very common for people who are sober a long time to experience um, uh, what does Chuck Chamberlain call it? Obsessions of the mind. And as we know, obsessions of the mind can sometimes tip over into the material world and we can find little behaviours which are exciting and interesting to divert us for five years or so. Um, behind lots of serious acting out with you know, sort of sex, romance, gambling, food, those are the main ones. Um, there are very often unfinished amends and the unfinished amends very often match the areas of dysfunction. So I think the the urgency is very great, really. Uh, What's different about it? uh, so, So the passage of time does not diminish the necessity or the urgency of the amend. In fact, if anything, the reverse happens. What is different is the approach to the person one's making amends to, I think, must acknowledge the outrageous amount of time it's taken to get round to this. 
uh, because they're going to be outraged anyway. So you might as well take that on the chin up front. So the first thing you're apologizing for is, is for taking so long to get back to them. Um, but otherwise, I think it's pretty standard. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any difference. That what does happen, though, the longer you're sober, I think the more morally punctilious you get. Uh, so there are certain harms. Uh, not, a, not every amend is, uh, you know, some grand apology for a terrible wrong done. Sometimes it was a, a, an expression of thanks, which was not given at the time, but, with, but which was definitely due. Or we were, uh, there was a, a teacher at school that was enormously helped. I was very troubled. Uh, there was a teacher at school who was enormously helpful. And uh, when I left, the, so it was a boarding school. When I left there, uh, it was very clear I was heading in the wrong direction. You know, that the pundits would not have had me uh, recovering and having a you know a reasonably successful happy life and I'd never got back to her to tell her that she had helped me and that things did work out in the end um and she came into my consciousness after many years sober and it needed to be dealt with and I dealt with it and through a very very strange set of coincidences I managed to find her and uh it was a wonderful thing to do so I think one's spider sense increases over time. That must be listened to. All sorts of things will come up in one's consciousness, which need dealing with. And the, your model for this is uh, an American AA from Riverside, Chicago, Illinois, called Paul M., Paul Martin, who wrote extensively for the grapevine. He was brought in uh, by... Uh, into AA by I think the first AA in Chicago he died with about 62 years of sobriety not actually that long that long ago uh, but he talks about the enormously beneficial effect of really going back and dotting the i's and crossing the t's with amends even many many years later and how when he was in his 60s going back and things which had come up in his consciousness from his childhood, which he went back and dealt with. And I think in the last, in my, my own program, the last five years, the mo apart from sponsoring people, the most important things I've done have, in terms of clearing my consciousness have been um, uh, what looked like relatively small indiscretions or oversights or, or whatever that I've had to make amends for. So I think it's an ongoing process. You remain spiritually open and all sorts of things will continue to call out woodwork and when they do you deal with them so that's my answer on that thanks Tim. anybody else my name's dan i'm an alcoholic sorry alistair i'm just going to come in Tim, can i just ask you something to qualify uh, a statement you said i hope i heard this right because i was i was um dealing with the screaming child at the same time but it's something that really stuck with me did you say that the area that the problem was coming up uh, when I think you were talking in terms of uh, sex, money, food, was related to the area where you needed to make amends. Is that what you said? And if you did say that, can you sort of clarify what that means for me? Thanks. Yeah, so I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big subject, this. Um, but if you'll allow a story which is about a minute and a half, there is an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I think it's somewhere in season two or season three. You'll have to watch both seasons to be sure where there is a, but you're going to be doing that anyway. Um, the, <laughs> where there was a school where uh, whenever at night, two people would come into a particular, if it was a boy and a girl were alone in this particular corridor, they would start to play out a, a, like a script and a gun would appear and one would shoot the other one. And it was like they were possessed by something. And then afterwards they couldn't work. They had no idea what had happened. They had those sort of vague recollections. 
And the fact is, unresolved psychic situations will seek a way to re-manifest in order for me to deal with them. So the reason why I would recreate for years disastrous friendships and situations and sponsorship relationships and jobs is because I hadn't resolved the past. Not fully. I hadn't fully forgiven or I hadn't fully made amends. When I fully forgave and fully made amends, the bond was that the, the, there was a resolution there. So there was no need for me to create the situation. Earl Purdy talks about in relationships, like the, the unholy relationships, so un, unhealthy relationships, where with each new unhealthy relationship, you're taking the prime features of all of the previous relationships, bundling them into this new scenario, in fact, looking for someone to perform a historical, a composite historical reenactment of all the past relationships in order to get the ending to change. But because the setup is the same, because the frame of reference is the same, the ending can't change. So it all turns out the same until the reason for the sick dynamic is eliminated, then that sickness stops. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's not a straightforward issue um, to, to, uh, to understand. You've got to see it a lot playing out in your life before it, it, it becomes clear. But I think that's the, that's, that, that's the, the explanation for it in brief. Thanks, Tim. Anyone else? Uh, I'll hand it back to you, Tim, if you could close it with the serenity prayer. Thank you. Uh, to set the tone for the uh, meeting, I will read an extract from Chapter 1, Bill's Story, page thir- pages 13 and 14. Um, I, I was to test my, new, my thinking by the, by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself, except as my request bore on my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive, but that would be in great measure. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. And um, the topic of tonight's meeting is working step 10 with a sponsee. And Tim will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic, after which the floor will be opened for questions rather than the typical sharing. And with that, I will now hand over to Tim. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me, Alistair? Good, thanks. So step 10 is slightly problematical because if you look at uh, page 59 uh, or the wall scrolls, you've got 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were prom- when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. And you've got the 12 and 12, which has got its own take on step 12, on step 10, rather, which I'm not going to go into. And then you've got what happens in in AA in general. Um, You'll usually hear people sharing, well, I did a step 10 last night. And what they did is they did a very sort of long written analysis of some emotional turmoil. That's what it usually means. Like a mini step four or something at night. and uh, I think it's important, I've said it before, it's important to remember with any of the steps that the uh, this little summary on page 59 is just that. It's simply an aid memoir for what the step contains. It's not a set of instructions for how to do the step. And as someone rightly said, that if you do the steps off the wall, uh, uh, if you do the program off the wall, you'll have an off the wall program. So if you try to do and people do that, they try to divine what a step is just looking at that. saying, well, that's all I need. I don't need anything else. Um, so you get these complex analyses of shortcomings versus defects of character. 
uh, and people are saying uh, this is though people are just going on what it says in step six and seven on the wall or on page 59 and there's no other information available so we've just got to divine it from the words and of course that won't do it's it's like if you've got a recipe book and in in the recipe book it says it's got sort of page 17 quiche lorraine uh page 18 black forest gato you might have something of an idea of what the recipe is but that falls very far short of knowing how to make a quiche Lorraine or a Black Forest Gatto. And you wouldn't want to try and make up the recipe based on your sort of general knowledge of, of, of what a quiche Lorraine from Tesco's is like. Well, particularly the quiche Lorraine from Tesco's. Um, let alone the Black Forest Gatto. Don't get me going on British versions of French cooking. But anyway, um, that's possibly a digression, although not necessarily. So, um, uh, what does step 10 mean in practice? Well, I th it's very clear that, well, first of all, if you've done a step four, that's not it for inventory for the rest of your life. We're going to have to do something. And as far as actual instructions in the book for step uh, 10 are concerned, they're actually contained in step 10 proper, we'll call it, pages 84 to 85. And then there is an implementation of the idea of step 10, continue to take personal inventory and so-called nightly review when we retire at night on page 86. And then there's the principle of step 12, which says we practice these principles, which principles, the above principles in the preceding 11 steps in all our affairs. In other words, we continue to practice all of the steps as and when needed when the situation arises. So whatever tools are available, uh, you use them as needed. So the question, you know, if one does an in-depth inventory, either of one's whole life on a particular area uh, uh, or either on your whole life or on a particular area, uh, you know, are you doing another step four? Are you doing step 10? Well, I think the answer is yes. You're doing step 10 in the form of uh, using the step four instructions as your method of doing it. But the step you're actually practicing is step 10, but it's employing step four methods. So you've really got three ways of doing inventory in AA. There's page 84 to 85, which I'll come to. There's the step 11 review, and there's the um, the step four method. And uh, I don't know about your sponsees, but mine occasionally have a tiny little tendency to be a little bit self-absorbed. Um, uh, and I have a tiny little tendency to, to be a little bit self-absorbed at times. So I have to be very careful with inventory that it doesn't become a socially acceptable form of self-obsession. So the first principle I introduce with people is, yes, you're going to need to continue to take inventory. But what we want to do, it's like with it's like if you've got a bacterial infection, uh, they first of all give you the standard uh, antibiotic. And if that doesn't work, they'll escalate to a more potent one. And if you really if you're really struggling, they'll go to the special cupboard and get the very, very special antibiotic, which they don't want to release you know, uh, uh, and have create uh, resistant bacteria. So that it's under very controlled conditions that they will administer certain bacteria and I think uh, certain uh, antibiotics. And so I think it's the same with the continuing to take personal inventory. I think one should uh, adopt the step 10 practice per the big book very, very frequently. The nightly review with a lightness of touch, but we'll come to that when we do step 11. And the step four style inventory, either resentment inventory, the uh, page 67 questions, the fear inventory, the sex inventory, and the construction of a sane, act, sane and sound ideal only infrequently. <laughs> uh, so it's in that sort of ascending order uh, of severity so not immediately to leap to doing a daily step four i've met people that have done that drives them completely mad every day they sit down do half an hour of 
very complex written analysis and they find themselves writing the same things over and over and over. So sometimes you have to deprogram people from that uh, obsessive compulsive sort of nitpicking at oneself. Um, and it's like these, uh, you know, people sometimes uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, I'm told, can manifest it in, in sort of scratching the same piece of skin again and again and again until it becomes uh, sort of red and raw. Maybe Claire can enlighten us on whether that's an accurate portrayal of that particular symptom. Not because she suffers it from herself. I think she may have some professional <laughs> insight into that. But you know what I mean? I think inventory can become like that. So you need to let people off the hook, really in a sense. And then let's go to 84. So what did it actually say? This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we can take, we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. So this is giving us a general guide to what step 10 is about. And if you want an image, you're adjusting the steering wheel. So you're not getting out of the car, you're not taking the, gar the car to the garage every five minutes, you're adjusting the steering wheel as you go along. But that's not a, an actual instruction, it's just a sort of concept of, of what the step involves. We vigorously commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. So to me, this is uh, the, the point at which we start to clean up the past is in step four. So I give people the principles of 10, 11 and 12 as soon as they start step four. In other words, as soon as they take step three, their life goes on two tracks. There's the overall arc of four through nine and then there's the daily arc of 10, 11 and 12. We've entered the world of the spirit where our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Now that's again just a general uh, description of what we're undertaking here. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. Uh, so uh, again, this is step 10. Sometimes people say I've completed the steps and I'm, I think you complete the first nine steps, but I'm not sure you can complete um, the last three. Uh, I, an acquaintance of mine in AA many years ago talked about how she was sober you know, a fair amount of time, 13, 14 years, very involved in intergroup. And she said how she'd got to the end of the steps with her sponsor and they got a little cake and they put a candle on the cake and they lit the candle and they blew it out. I don't know what significance this had. And she said to mark the fact that we completed the steps. And within about two years, we never saw her again. So she, 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 she so completed them, she left AA. Now, you don't want to do that. You don't want to think you've completed the steps with or without a candle. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm afraid you're sort of rather locked into this. Um, this is why in step three, you get people to think very carefully before they take step three. Uh, I, I, do you want to do this for the rest of your life? Now, you only have to swallow it a day at a time. It's like with laundry or, you know, do you commit to doing laundry for the rest of your life? Do you commit to brushing your teeth for the rest of your life? Yes, but you don't have to pre-brush your teeth for the next 60 years. You just have to commit to the daily actions. Um, now, here it actually begins to get into instructions. So continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear. Uh, now, these are the only four that it asks us to look for. But very clearly, uh, the spirit of this is to be looking out for any defect of character. It can't possibly be their intention um, to uh, uh, simply watch for these, but you know, if you've got a problem, I don't know, with sort of punching people in the face or something, well, don't worry about that. It's not on the list of four, so you can do that. You can go to, to, to I don't know, quick save even exists anymore, but you can go to Lidl and punch people in the queue if you want, because that's all right. It's not on the list, so you're fine. We must have none of that legalism. So everything falls under those categories. What I get people to look for is to consider resentment in this context to be any upset, any emotional upset or negative reaction to the present or the past, fancied or real. So a lot of people get very upset about things which aren't really there. 
Now the the upset is real. Well, I said I thought, sure I've told this story before. I said to Jonathan once about, about something, but it's my lived experience. He said yes, but that doesn't mean it's real. So uh, you, you watch out for any form of upset about the past or the present. That's resentment. Any form of upset about the future. That's fear. Dishonesty. You've got. Uh, I think four basic types of dishonesty, concealment, distortion, fabrication, and uh, uh, underhand behavior, scheming. So, uh, and those four are quite distinct. So the first three are about representations of the truth. You're either concealing the truth to yourself or to others, you're distorting it or you're making up something which isn't there. The fourth one is to do with honest dealings, I think. And this comes under various headings that there can be active scheming and plotting to get one over on someone else. But also manipulation falls under this category. Now, the difficulty here is is with politeness. So politeness is a form of deceit and manipulation. Uh, so when you say you know, I'd be terribly pleased if, if if you could find a moment to do dot, dot, dot. It's, it's, it's not strictly honest. It's a manipulative way. Or I'd be so grateful if you did so and so. It's a manipulation, but it's a socially acceptable one, which is part of the culture that to exhibit eti so etiquette and politeness require a certain amount of effectively manipulation, deception about your true intent and your true feelings about a situation. We're not talking about that. We're talking about... Um, something which crosses the line uh, in terms of manipulation or scheming or dis deception of another person. Uh, and selfishness is a very, very big bag indeed, which hold, which contains everything else. So every other defect of character is essentially a form of selfishness, putting self, putting oneself in form of, uh, it, it, ahead of someone else. The two things I would add to this list, which are, are, I mean, they are comprised within it one way or another, but particular mental habits to watch out for um, are fantasy and nostalgia. You can slot them in, you know, whether you slot them under dishonesty or selfishness, it doesn't really matter. But I find it can be very helpful to keep a particular eye out for those. And to also recognize that that these come in sometimes unrecognized forms. So um, um, say fear can come in the form of fretting and worrying and brooding. Um, uh, what else? Uh, selfishness can come in the form of all of the plots and schemes to fix change and control another person. Plan, scheme, plot, fix, change, control. Um, uh, resentment can come in the form of, of, of grumbling and, and moaning and griping and criticizing and judging and all of those things. So really, one must be watching out for the full range of everything one is capable of. Now, the question is, uh, there's an important principle here to convey. Um, I've had sponsees object, understandably, to steps 10 and 11, particularly the review part of 10, 10 and 11, or, or 10 or 11 rather, the nightly review. Uh, sorry, I'm a bit tired this evening, so I'm slightly all over the place. Um, people object to those steps on the basis that, well, we're being hard on ourselves, we're very, very hard on ourselves. And one of my characters, people will say, one of my character defects is beating myself up, and another one is perfectionism. And aren't I, I'm just I'm not going to do this because it's just beating myself up and it's just being perfectionistic. If your arm was broken, you wouldn't say, well, I, I'm not I don't want to seek perfect restoration of the motor function in my left arm. because That's just being perfectionistic. So I shall put up with a broken arm. Uh, one wouldn't do that. And also one wouldn't. It, it, if you went to the doctors and you had a, uh, um, you had you had an X-ray done, the the 
uh, doctor said, well, you've got a fracture of, of the, I don't know, the, the, the distal epiphysis of your ulna. You wouldn't say, you're, be you're being really hard on me. You're beating me up. No, the doctor's just diagnosed what's wrong with you. Do you want to get it fixed or don't you? Now, and this is relevant here, is when you're watching, you are the watcher. You are not the thing that you're watching. You are watching for these characteristics cropping up where? In your belief, your, your beliefs, your thinking, your behavior. So what you're looking at is the tools that you're using for living. And who wouldn't want better tools? Who, who wouldn't want to wear better clothes? Who wouldn't want to, to eat better food? So this is the way I always explain it, is, is you're keeping an eye on this stuff so that your life will improve. These are not defects of yours in that they're not, they're not you. They're what you're carrying around and don't want to be. So it's always in your interest to spot these. But to treat the faculty of watching uh, as being like one of those uh, antivirus programs, which is constantly running in the background, scanning this and scanning that. But if... It, if you if you're at least if your computer is powerful enough it doesn't slow down the running of your computer and the performance of your daily tasks you're still able to do everything that, without any compromise whatsoever so it only flags up a problem if there is one you're not constantly obsessed with yourself so it, it, it's developing the ability it's developing a sense of mindfulness towards one's own uh, beliefs thinking and behavior particularly the thinking as it proceeds in real time um when these crop up we analyze them at great oh no it doesn't say that it says we ask god at once to remove them because this is of course what everyone does <laughs> um people say i need to talk to you about my resentment and you're like how do you know now i know you've got one how do you know you need to talk about the resentment? Maybe you just need to ask God to remove it or do the prayers on page 67 or, you know, I don't know, go and eat a cake or something. I'd, but, but just drop it. Just drop it. I'm sure you've seen the Bob Newhart sketch. Stop it. If you haven't seen the Bob Newhart sketch, stop it. Go and watch it immediately after this. Get a YouTube Bob Newhart, N-E-W-H-A-R-T, and stop it. So we've already proved in step four that resentment is futile and fatal. We've already proved that fear is nonsense created out of the illusion that we are physical beings. So we don't need to reanalyze them. There's a caveat later on, I'll come to that. So basically, what we want to do is immediately adjust back to the present, back to awareness of the presence of God, back to the task at hand. So when it says now, it does say we just discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Now, we discuss them with someone immediately. The caveat, if you have a novel situation which requires negotiation, then you might need to discuss it with someone else. If you've got a practical course of action that you're uncertain of in terms of how to fix something, then of course you have to discuss it with someone else. But I found even in my early years, the need, the actual need to do this was infrequent. Uh, I did need to do daily debriefing with friends and I still do. But uh, I only call people during the day or interrupt them with a rapid fire troubleshooting round of right this is the situation how should i look at it what should i do then immediately get back to uh the task at hand um the last clause of that phrase of that sentence we discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone there is ambiguity, unfortunately. The ambiguity is the scope of the conditional clause. So if we have harmed anyone, does that govern just we make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone or we discuss and make amends quickly if we've harmed anyone? I, I take the first one. So we discuss anything of importance with someone, uh, but the making amends quickly is uh, 
obviously only if we have harmed someone. So we do get to discuss things even if we haven't harmed someone. So harming someone is not the only condition for discussion. Um, then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Uh, now, sometimes uh, this operates at two levels. The first level at which this operates is sometimes I fall into some complacency of some description and I just, uh, I'm just not, do I'm not going to enough meetings. I'm not talking to enough people. I'm not making enough effort with my service. There are, there's always little extra bits of service you can do if you put your mind to it. Sometimes the turning of thoughts uh, means uh, turning your thoughts to the, the, the task at hand from which someone will benefit. So you repurpose the task at hand as being something for the benefit of the person that it's ultimately for. Or sometimes what you can do, and this is a very good trick, uh, whatever you're going through, uh, imagine when you're next at a meeting, how you'll share about how you're currently using the program to address this situation and turn it round with God's help. So you're immediately repurposing the very cause of the upset or whatever it is to being uh, something that you can use to help other people. And so this comes straight from the big book where it talks about capitalizing. When trouble comes, we capitalize it. Uh, using it as an opportunity to demonstrate God's omnipotence. And you can activate that straight away. I remember I, I, I did that when, um, you know, so when, when I, I don't know the word disaster or catastrophe, when, when very serious events have occurred, particularly in my family, to immediately lock, uh, you know, you lock on to that method and say, right, this is the test. It was always coming. I'm going to use this as a test of can I remember and apply the program and recall as much as possible of what is going on that I can then use this in meetings to demonstrate how the program works. Completely changes your attitude to the crisis situation. Now, the next passage is strictly a set of promises. What I encourage people to do, um, there are a couple of things here that I can use, I can turn them into instructions so that one tries to make the most out of this. We have ceased fighting anything or anyone and to practice using this as a corrective measure. Who in my life am I currently in conflict with? What would happen if I stopped fighting? And fighting can come in all sorts of forms. It can come in the form of arguing, answering back, um, fixed change control. It can come in the form of... Uh, uh, repeated requests when one request would do like if you request something once and the person doesn't do it they have you know when people say I haven't been heard no they've heard you they just don't they're just not going to do it and so you don't so fighting can take all sorts of different forms just to leave things be um other good examples of how you can encourage people to do this is uh someone <laughs> Someone, I don't know where this tape is going, but well, I'm just going to go for it. Someone called me a few, I don't know, a couple of years ago about their home group. And they said the group consciences were going on for like two hours and they had a backlog, they having, having a group conscience once or twice a month. And they had a backlog of about four months of suggestions from people about how to change the group. And ceasing fighting can be, just go to your home group, share for three minutes and keep your mouth shut in business meetings and group conscience meetings. There's nothing worse than a group where you've got sort of 47 people trying to basically fight the reality of what the group is and trying to change it the whole time. So just to leave as many things be as possible, leave as many people be as possible, reserve, uh, keep your powder dry and... Uh, uh, pick your battles. Uh, what else can we look at here? Um, we feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. I have mentally a sort of space I can go to, which is a place of complete neutrality, in which I'm safe and protected. And I encourage people to 
visualize this themselves, particularly in the minutes before going to sleep, imagining that like your, your being, your spirit, your aura, whatever you want to call it, traveling to this place, which is real reality, with this realm being like a shadow land or a stage and the other place being real reality where everything is neutral where everything is safe where you're protected and i'm in a position now because i've done this such a lot i can just go like that and be there and i'm fine uh, it's a very helpful thing to foster so this stuff will happen automatically but it doesn't hurt to give it a helping hand uh, so there's no there's no conflict between turning everything over to god and doing your bit and the principle here is god will do for you what you can't do for yourself but god won't do for you what you can do for yourself uh, it is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels um uh, i think it's well said that the laurels are the sense of achievement from having completed the first nine steps. Sometimes people say they're resting on their laurels. Now, unless you finish the first nine steps, it ain't your laurels you're resting on. It's something else. You might want, I don't want to alarm you, but you might want to just stand up and see what you're sitting in. Because <laughs> it, it ain't laurels. Um, we're headed for trouble if we do for alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. And now it's, that's, that's all lovely, blah, blah. Now we have the instructions. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. I get an exercise I get people to do. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but it won't hurt to mention it again because we've all got goldfish brains. Um, uh, the book talks about a sane and sound ideal on page 69 as a problem solving tool. Here it talks about the vision of God's will. Uh, in the 12 and 12 and step 11, it talks about if an architect is going to build a building, he has to visualize it first. Otherwise, nothing is going to get built. And on page 83, it talks about there is a long period of reconstruction ahead. And of course, reconstruction can't take place without a vision. Now, I think there's a balance here uh, between on one hand, asking God what to do in the moment and being flexible and adaptable and all of those things. But I think it's also important when I get to the end of a step nine process with people, I get them to do something that I do whenever I'm in trouble in an area is to have a sane and sound ideal, straight vision of God's will for, for me in that area. So those are beliefs, thinking patterns and behavior patterns, which act as corrective measures to current problems so that I've got a sense of what I'm trying to do. So one of the things I've had with sponsorship which i'm gradually getting better at is is i'm i'm a little more patient than i used to be and so when the phone is ringing when i sit ringing I, there, there are the the vision that the the same as sound i'm the vision of god's will is to, to to be patient to try to sit down rather than pace uh all sorts of other little tricks to make sure that i'm responding in a, in as measured a way as i can muster on the day in question so so i'm not just going into think situations blindly i'm going in with a sense of what i should be now the progress towards those same and sound ideals if you're anything like me is painfully and embarrassingly slow but it's better than nothing and uh it's i i don't know what the alternative is other than to have that vision of god's will how can i best serve thee thy will not mine be done that's a very powerful restorative for a situation where I give this to people, that line, as a restorative, when they're in a situation involving other people, particularly work, family, home group, where they're all in a tizzy and all mentally separated from anyone, everyone around them, stuck in their own head. As I did this, I remember a family situation. In my family, situations throw us together in the same room on occasion very infrequently but when they do none of us know what to say to each other and um, we can just about put names to faces but it's awkward it's embarrassing 
people make the most appalling small talk. I mean, small talk that that pe people have to leave the room. They're so embarrassed about how trivial and unreal it is. I remember a, a particular canard going on for about 20 minutes uh, one year about whether or not we have they have Christmas crackers in France. And someone actually could not stand. They had to leave the room because they were going to explode. And I, uh, these situations are so tense. I just say no now. I just don't go. It's, everything's much happier. Uh, but in situations like that, I would, as, as soon as I say, God, how can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. I can start to contribute more constructively and humanly to the situation. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. So I, th I think uh, step 10 is a game of two halves. Uh, you're on one hand spotting all the stuff you shouldn't be doing, particularly with your mind. People get quite good at behaviour after a while in AA, but the mind seems to be the thing which takes the longest time to catch up. Uh, so on one hand, on page 84, you're spotting all the problems. And it, in step 10 on page 85, you're saying, well, what's the solution? The solution is to be constantly thinking, what can I constructively contribute to this situation? We can exercise our willpower along this line. All we wish is the proper use of the will. So this results a question of if I let go, does that mean I sit there like a potato? No, you, you, you engage vigorously in the world. And there's a line earlier on that we're intelligent agents uh, of God's ever advancing creation. So it, it doesn't mean that one's not vigorously active. It's just the power, the direction for the vigorous activity and the power comes from God rather than from selfish demands. And uh, the next bit is a bit of blah, blah. It's very nice blah, blah, but it is, but there's no instructions in it. But much has already been said about receiving a strength, inspiration and direction from him who has all knowledge and power. Um, so uh, when people have a, uh, a problematical conception of God, I say, just rip, write down what you think your concept of God is. Now I tell them to rip up the piece of paper and say, go with this. So who is God? God is that which has all knowledge and power and is the source of strength, inspiration, direction. Go with that for five years, 10 years, and then come back and see how that works. It's a great definition of the higher power. What is God? The sort that the, the, the repository of all knowledge and all power what do you get from god strength inspiration and direction and you can turn it into a prayer oh you who have all knowledge and power please give me strength inspiration and direction and that's not a bad prayer and the next bit you have to caution people if we've carefully followed directions we've begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us to some extent we have become god conscious uh, we have begun to develop this vital sixth sense. Now, what some people understand this to mean is that you sort of have some paranormal experience. And if you're not having a paranormal experience with the presence of the actual creator of the universe in your living room with you or inside you, then if you don't have that experience, well, I'm obviously doing something wrong. And uh, there are some lovely people in AA who wax very lyrical about very conscious experiences of god now it's very very good but i i don't know if what they're experiencing is that or if it's something else it may be i'm experiencing it but just terming it very differently as i mentioned before sometimes you leave the house in the morning think, and you realize oh i'm having a nice day sun shining walking oh, there's a squirrel over there that's nice I'm just having a nice time other people might characterize that as feeling the presence of god whereas i think of it as seeing a squirrel and thinking that's nice could be the same could be this exactly the same actual experience but which is being construed and communicated in a different way so just because the sponsee doesn't feel the spirit of god the the, the holy spirit moving within him um, doesn't mean something has gone wrong. And in fact, if they do, it could be a sign of a mental health issue, which indeed sometimes it is. So I had someone once who um, uh, started to experience uh, God very in a very kind of real and tangible way. And um, the the vision started to become sexualized, which I don't think is helpful. I don't think that's part of the program. Now, if that happens, you might want to tone down the step 11 and just keep it super practical. 
Um, so you've got to be slightly careful with that. Now, the question is, well, what does it mean? Uh, it means that you are more likely than otherwise to remember to call your mother. You realize you start to realize two days before the laundry tablets run out that you need to go and buy some new ones rather than only realizing once they've run out. It's remembering to do the things you said you were going to do. It's it's saying something particularly acidic and for the first time in your life realizing, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I'm going to apologize right now. So you think that set the flow of God's spirit into you is some sort of uplifting, you know, like, like being lifted on angel wings. Very often it's a sudden and new sense of responsibility and guilt for things undone that's how you know that god is your your when you now feel guilty for things which are wrong which you wouldn't have batted an eyelash i eyelid what do you bat eyelids eyelashes whatever that you wouldn't have batted an eyelid at six months ago but suddenly you're wet you narrow you're 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 now aware of your effect on other people i think that it's awareness of reality that's what happens and generally having better ideas than you did before so i think that's probably all i've got on step 10 so alistair do you want to uh turn it over for questions thank you very much tim yeah and with that um i'll open up the meeting for um for questions which can be done by the raised hand function in zoom uh, or you can message me through the chat function and i can ask tim directly if all else fails, please just wave your hand at the camera and I will try to come to you. Uh, and we'll try to close uh, on the hour mark. Uh, but sometimes we run a bit over. Uh, I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, I've got uh, two questions, actually. One is kind of like um, uh, one I baked earlier, so to speak. Uh, it was on my mind before this session. And, and what I'm going to ask right now is, is more of a technical nature. Um, but as the... Um, the pre-baked question relates more to the, the 12 and 12. I, I won't ask that unless unless we have time. But the um, the technical question is um, is to do with the big four. So we've got to continue to watch for uh, selfishness, uh, dishonesty, resentment, and and fear. I've always found a very helpful list. You're know, trying to simplify people's approach to, to step four. You know, look look no further. The, these are the big ones. But there is something a bit odd about it, which I ne never really understood, never really dared to articulate my uncertainty about it, which is that the, the list is in a different order from what we had in um, step four, where we're told that resentment is the number one offender and lying behind that is selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking and fear. So that's a, that's a different list. And then, and then again, if you go back to step three, you've got um, first uh, selfishness, um, which is defined as being... I lost the place. Um, yeah, um, to do with uh, self-centeredness, resentments, and self-pity, and then selfishness, <laughs> uh, being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Now, I, I can almost hear the answer ringing in my ears that you know th these are these are concepts which are inevitably fuzzy at the edges you know overlapping they don't lend themselves to, to to crisp definition um but i have to there's certainly been times in my own recovery and when i've been trying to help other people perhaps when i'd have given my it through a venn diagram um if the big book had been written by the harvard, harvard business school at some point it would have been a, a venn diagram showing how these how these concepts um overlap and kind of interlock with each other um so that's my question, really. Uh, do you, is there any significance at, at all to be attached to the, the varying orders? And just one, one further point on that. When you were talking about dishonesty, you didn't specifically mention self-delusion. And I've always thought that self-delusion seems to be the source of the problem more than almost anything else um, in the people that I, I find myself dealing with. It's the stories they tell themselves, which are very often you know, completely wrong. And when you point that out, it's like, oh, it's, I, I haven't realised that, you know, sort of end of problem. So I'll stop there. Okay, so there are lots of questions there. So uh, 
just in the order that I remember them. This is like the generation game with the conveyor belt. Um, <laughs> if any of you are old enough to remember that or British enough to remember that. Uh, so, the yeah, so, so those forms of dishonesty, uh, uh, you've got concealment, distortion, fabrication. Those can be towards oneself or towards other people. So it's equal opportunities. But the, the same scheme applies to both concealment, distortion or fabrication. Uh, so I think that covers that one. Um, with the order, I'd be extremely hesitant to read an order into them without further evidence. Uh, there, there, is what, there are some places where there are extraordinary coincidences with order. I'll give you one. Uh, it talks about when the spiritual condition clears up. Let me just get the exact quotation. I want to get the exact quotation out. On page 64, where is it? When the spiritual malady is overcome, so spiritual, we straighten out mentally, mentally and physically, physically, spiritually, mentally, physically, mind, uh, spirit, mind, body. So you get spiritually straight first and your mind clears up, then your body, your circumstances clear up third. And it echoes that later on the big book that spiritual, the spiritual comes first, the material comes second. And in step 11 on page 86, when you ask God, what you ask God for is inspiration, an intuitive thought or a decision, which mirror those three levels of spirit, mind, body in that specific order. So there are occasional coincidences there. I've not discerned any particular significance to the ordering of uh, resentment, fear, selfishness and dishonesty. There, there, is the, there are those little quartets which appear all the way through the big book. Another one is patient, tolerant, kind and loving. And that occurs with some variation throughout the book. The orders, the order changes. One of the words changes at a particular point. So um, I'm hesitant to read too much into it. When Bill wants to point something out, he'll probably he'll usually do it overtly. Those other little coincidences, I suspect, are um, uh, inadvertent manifestations of his underlying design rather than treasures which are hidden in the style of the Da Vinci Code. Because people read all sorts of stuff into the big book as though there's buried treasure which has been left there on purpose. And Bill is you know, giggling behind his hands trying to work out which smart Alec is, gonna, is going to, to, to join the dots and, you know, solve the riddle. I don't think it's riddles. Uh, now, with selfishness, you've got you've got three big places where it gets described. The first one is that little passage on 61 where it talks about let's well, let's get the passage. Where is it? Um, or 62, rather selfishness, self-centeredness. And I mean, there it's presenting them as as uh, effective synonyms that being one thing. It doesn't say those. It says that we think is the root of our troubles. Earlier on, it gives self-centered and egocentric as synonyms. Uh, by the way, the way Bill uses dashes is to say the thing before the dash is the same as the thing after the dash, or the thing after the dash is entailed by the thing before the dash. So in step one, powerlessness entails our manageability. They're not two unrelated motions. One entails the other. And because that's just how Bill uses dashes. So he's doing exactly the same there. Selfishness, self-centeredness. And then it's got these other, it, then it's got the subdivisions of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. So you've got that little cluster there. You've got the page 67 questions, which very clearly overlap. So on page 67, when you say, what are my mistakes? If you accurately answer, what are all of my mistakes? You'll capture everything that is self-seeking, all the fear, all the dishonesty, all the faults, all the wrongs, because all of those things are, by definition, mistakes. So those are deliberately overlapping terms. And then you've got a, a completely different usage here on page uh, 84 with um, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment and fear. 
being a little quartet, which I think is supposed to capture the full gamut of human ills. So I think selfishness here, since it's supposed to be, it must be terribly broad, really covers everything to do with self, all, all of those little self-aggrandisement, self-abasement, self this, self that, self-delusion, all of the forms of self come under that. It's meant, I, I, use, I, well, I use it at any rate in a, in a much narrower way on page 67 to really hone in. So self-seeking is on page 67 is what am I after? Um, selfishness is where I'm putting my interests ahead of other people's. And what I get people to do, I think this is very helpful, Put yourself in the shoes of the other person in the situation. Ask what interests of mine, being the other person, are being compromised by the sponsee's behavior. So, so in the strict sense, I would call selfishness where I put myself illegitimately ahead of other people. Uh, but selfishness here is a much broader term which aims to capture everything. Does that cover? I think that covers all your points, Seamus. Yes, yes, thanks. That was much more comprehensive than I was daring to hope, actually. Thanks, thanks very much, Tim. Yeah, that's great. And what was the techie question on the 12 and 12? Ah, yes. Um, uh, it's the spiritual axiom. Uh, I, I had to do a talk about this, and it got me thinking about the spiritual axiom. It's a spiritual axiom that every time we are disturbed, there is something the matter with us. Yeah. And I got to thinking about this, and I thought about, what about dead mothers? So your mother dies and you're upset or disturbed. Um, does that really, uh, is that really what we're trying to say or, or is it not? Not because when I look at the big book, I cannot actually get to the spiritual action. The closest I can get is um, sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation, but we invariably find that at some time in the past, we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. Um, so I'm not sure about the spiritual axiom. And it is, is grief a form of um, disturbance, which is, you know, to some extent, um, a, matter of, a matter of choice? I mean, uh, many great religions have um, practices around grief that suggest that it's something to be, um, it, well, if not welcome, certainly accommodated, um, rather than, shall we say, got rid of do you see where i'm what i'm yeah talking? absolutely yeah so it's a it's a it's a well-established question um and it's a good one it's a helpful one um let's make i'm going to make a three-way distinction there are types of emotion that i would refer to as uh notifications so fear is a notification that my mind has spotted a threat. That's the nature of fear. Uh, resentment is a notification from or, or a, a little burst of anger, not resent, a little burst of anger. So fear in the moment when a fear hits you, it's it's a little notification that there is a threat when anger hits me. It's a little notification that something does not match the blueprint for how things should be. Guilt is a notification that my conduct doesn't match the blueprint for what my conduct should be. So you've got three basic notifications, uh, anger, fear and uh, guilt. Um, uh, and also as a subset of guilt, there is shame, which is a sense that I in my being am not as the blueprint would stipulate. Now, the thing about these emotions, I, ooh, I don't think I, I'm sceptical about calling them emotions even. I liken them to lights on the dashboard of the car. Either they're on or they're off. They have no colour. They have no flavour. They are dull. I don't know about your rage, but when I'm raging, it doesn't matter what I'm raging about. The feeling is the same. When I'm frightened, the f whether I'm frightened of 
uh, <laughs> something ridiculous and trivial or something um, world churning. The feeling is the same. They're not really emotions. And, and Rabbi Manes Friedman said a very extraordinary thing in one of his talks. He's very in Manis Friedman. He's very interesting. There's almost everything he says is entirely unexpected. Some of his stuff is is really for, you know, for family only, as it were. You know, if, unless you're Orthodox and Jewish, it won't be of any relevance whatsoever because he addresses specifically matters within that domain but lots of his stuff is of universal application and one's got to be slightly careful what one's listening to but some stuff is completely impenetrable um but he said that anger is not an emotion it's a barrier between you and the other person which prevents you from feeling anything real and i think there's something to that so on one hand we've got these notification style emotions i'm using emotions in inverted commas so we've got these notifications on the other hand you know it depends what music you listen to some music is very monochrome emotionally there's a lot of excitement but there's not a lot going on emotionally but if you listen to music which has got a lot going on emotionally so i don't know mozart's um either the 40th or the 40, 41st symphony um uh, any Beethoven piano sonata has got a huge amount going on emotionally. If you sit, if you really listen and listen a few times in the space of half an hour, you will have a thousand emotions, none of which are remotely describable. That's emotion. Or when you spend an afternoon with someone and you have this, and you're genuinely with them you have this kaleidoscope of emotions the same as when you're with small children or animals or with nature kaleidoscope of emotions all of which defy description there's a categorical difference between uh, a fire alarm and a symphony orchestra playing and that's the difference between on one hand anger fear guilt shame and on the other hand all of the emotions of life now onto this so those are two those are two types the third type is is disturbance and disturbance is it's to do with a state where of resistance of reality where i'm resisting reality in some way and it activates all sorts of as it were subroutines or subsystems of fixed change control plot plan scheme uh fret brood worry moan wine gripe and all now there are flavors within though because that's the superstructure built on top of the the alarm comes in and the department gets activated and all of the darkness the interesting darkness of coen brothers films resides in that disturbance realm and it is interesting it's not as interesting as beethoven but it is in, it is interesting uh it's not as interesting as mozart so what it's talking about is when i'm disturbed when i'm resisting reality the problem is me not reality now when you come to there i think there are two there are two types of event which are of interest here the first one when in a healthy person let's say you are racing for a train and it's cancelled you might have the emotion of disappointment you might have the emotion of anger you might have all sorts of different emotions in a healthy person they'll pass straight through you and then you resolve what to do and then you get on with your day and there might be a little residue left behind um if if you're at a, ever at a train station and you see or or an airport and you see a, something which is cancelled and you watch different people's reactions and some people couldn't give a shit they're just reading their book like honey badger doesn't give a damn other people immediately start storming up to the desk and they transport themselves into the state of disturbance and stay stuck there so that state of disturbance is a state where the fire alarm has gone off everyone else has turned the fire alarm off 
and has gone on with their day. Whereas the disturbed person is sitting, shouting at the fire alarm rather than turning it off. And that's your fundamental difference. When you come to grief, grief is, is the people always go to the, the most difficult example. And C.S. Lewis says, if, you, if you're struggling with a theological, philosophical question, it's usually best to start with the most banal of incidents and gradually progress towards the most extreme. So if you're learning how to forgive, you want to forgive Barbara, who does the flowers in the church down the road, who, who you can't stand because her teeth clack when she's eating. Start with, start with something like that rather than the Nazis. Don't try and forgive the Nazis first. Put them maybe a little bit further down the list. It's like when people are questioning about God, you know, well, what about Syria? Well, yeah, what about... What about geraniums? Yeah, what, why, are you start, why are you starting with Syria? Can't we start with something more banal? Um, but, with, but the grief is a good example. Uh, and it's, it's interesting for all sorts of reasons. Uh, grief and death. OK, let's cover both of those in the next minute or so. Um, anthropologists will report that every society responds very, very differently to death. If you look at reports of how people would deal with infant mortality in the Middle Ages, very, very different to how people respond to infant mortality now. Um, the same with death in uh, death in the community, death in villages. Uh, children in some cultures, they're born into a community and they're raised by the whole community. And there still remains a relationship between the biological mother and the child, but it's not the same relationship as in the West. So the idea that any particular emotional reaction is somehow innate, that there are the predispositions towards that, but the cultural differences are so radical uh, I'd be very hard pushed to say that one is necessarily condemned to a particular reaction. And the best examples of this, uh, two examples, uh, if you hang around very old people in AA, you'll see a lot of them die of cancer, mostly because of smoking. It's usually lung cancer or pancreatic cancer or liver cancer. It seems to be the things that, that, pe that, that get people. And you meet people who have, I've met a number of people over the years who died in AA of, of, of very, and pancreatic cancer in particular is a very, very difficult one for various reasons. And to watch people go through those experiences where one would say one is necessarily condemned to enormous amounts of emotional suffering, people to walk through those with grace and cheerfulness. And I've seen people walk through grief with grace and cheerfulness, but um, without even much resistance. So a lot of it has got with grief, particularly a lot of it has got to do with the preparation for it and rejigging your attachments whilst the people are still alive. And if that if that rejigging takes place, you're going to have a completely different experience. You're going to have a completely different experience when the person dies. Now, when you have a very bad knock and you go into a grief process, either it can be because a person has died or because there's been a radical change. Often there is a very, very severe attachment which was created and fostered over many years. And because you've established the structure, just because, and sometimes you don't realize the structure of attachment is there until the catastrophe happens. And then you realize, and you're like, I, I, I would have liked to have known I was this attached before. Um, so I've lost my, I have no sense of smell now after COVID. Um, it's just not coming back. And uh, I wished I'd prepared for this, but I didn't. So there's a, I'm afraid you just have to go through the process. When the car stops, the momentum will mean that whatever is not nailed down will fly through the windscreen. You can't stop it on the basis you should have put a seatbelt on. So when something hits, even if there was a mistake of building an attachment, I'm afraid you have to go through the process. And it's no, you can't, it's too late to stop it because all of the events are in motion. Uh, but I think it's possible 
to walk through with sufficient preparation to walk through one's own, people walk through their own death experiences and walk through the grief of very significant losses without disturbance in the sense that it's described in the big book so pain is inevitable but suffering is optional was the phrase that was always given to me and uh it says although a situation was not our fault so we're not responsible for situations but we're 100 responsible for our contribution to them and it talks about our troubles are not of our own making uh, are of our own making rather now clearly there are events which are not of our own making but the trouble is the disturbance about it so it's not i mean i've tried to give as comprehensive an answer as i can to essentially what is a philosophical question which keeps people uh keeps philosophers in in clover in as far as they're ever in clover for for decades but that's the short answer Seamus thanks um i'd like to hand it hand the meeting back to you tim uh to to close with the serenity prayer uh to set the tone for the meeting i will read an extract from uh, a vision for you page 164 our book is meant to be suggestive only we realize we know only a little god will constantly disclose more to you and to us ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick the answers will come if your own house is in order but obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got see to it that your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others this is the great fact for us uh, and the topic of tonight's meeting is working step 11 with the sponsee and tim will share anything between 30 and 45 minutes on the topic after which the floor will be open for questions rather than the typical sharing and with that i will now hand over to tim an alcoholic very glad to be here thank you uh thank you for for listening <laughs> um i was i just be talking to myself uh, step 11 i think is 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 tricky for all sorts of reasons um i knew someone around oh 28 years ago in aa who was who was very good he was about eight years sober at the time and he's very spiritual and did all sorts of remarkable spiritual things and went on retreats and whenever he shared it was always about the you know the, the spiritual path and all of these wonderful things he was doing and and books and courses and enlightenment and all that sort of stuff but he drifted away from uh AA which he sort of saw as a a starting point for the spiritual journey and he as it were graduated and uh poor old thing end up and ends up in the drink and i think that did for him so he had some other medical conditions which weren't helped by the drinking um and that's not an unusual that's not an unusual story um uh, uh people who are sober longer than me have said that in aa we lose as many people out of the top uh you know if not into career and romance and money and materialism uh, uh into spirit, spiritual paths and religion uh, and i i have seen that happen uh and it, it is wonderful until of course you have a little drink <laughs> uh and then then you know so much for the chanting at that point or whatever else you're doing so there's a, there's a great difficulty there but it's very attractive all of that sort of stuff uh, and i find it very attractive and i've gone a long way in in the direction of religion and spirituality but in my case the cart very easily comes before the horse and i can forget what it's about and at the other end of the scale as well when when you've got you know there's very good sponsees who want to do everything they do want to do everything right they want to do the program right and they have a problem they say right i'm going to i'm going to up my prayer and meditation and again the danger can be can be that one amplifies the self absorption the absorb absorption with one's own spiritual path now of course step 11 is a bit of a damp squib really compared to 
you know, gurus and retreats and Goa and Nepal or what, whatever these destinations are. There was a wonderful, um, it was, I, I think, you know, those fake ladybird books, like that, 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 that there were those children's books introducing children to various aspects of the world or ladybird books. And they, they've done a number of, of parody ones in the last few years. And one of them was the ladybird book of meditation. And there was a picture, and it was all with sort of fake 1970s illustrations. Remember the sort of style of illustrations of children's books in the 1970s. Um, um, and it was, I won't get the caption right, but it was something like, uh, Susie was very upset to discover a Buddhist centre opening round the corner in Chiswick when she hoped her boyfriend was going to pay for a trip to Thailand for her. <laughs> And the thing is about step 11, as it was written in the in the big book, and there's a bit of AA history there. So it can't, AA comes, for better or for worse, from a form of so-called first century Christianity, which is non-doctrinal, but very definitely Christian. So non-doctrinal in that, you know, if you're in a, whether you are sort of high Anglican or an Episcopalian, they weren't too bothered. I think they they raise their eyebrows a little bit at Catholics but um uh but but the point was was to have a direct relationship with God to get direct guidance so it was not about exalted emotional states or uh or, or states of consciousness it was about getting direct concrete clear guidance about what to do uh, and so step 11 is very disappointing if you're on a spiritual path because it says praying only, only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Um, and so when directing and, and also the other thing about uh, so at sp one end of the scale, you've got these very, very keen sponsees that, that want to uh, invest a lot in their their spiritual life and then you've got people at the other end of the scale um uh that that you know wouldn't know the higher power if it stood up in their soup and and don't really care for any of that woo woo stuff they they was a rather poor scorn on it um and being a bit of a chameleon i i flip myself between those two two extremes um uh so one minute very attractive and the other minute rather sort of off put by it all uh, and so at the other end of the extreme you, the other end of the scale you've got sponsees who, who don't want anything to do with spirituality in the ordinary sense of the word in, in in the language and they're not interested in meditation in its current meaning and i think the antidote for for both categories and therefore for everyone in between is simply to stick very very closely to the wording so sought to improve our conscious contact with God. Now, I'll come to the word improve there because people make great play of it. Um, uh, improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Now, it talks in step 10 about having entered the world of the spirit. And it talks in step 12 about having a spiritual awakening and the 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 the. Uh, the most important fact of our lives is is the is consciousness of the presence of God and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and as I said, I think in an earlier earlier week, um, consciousness, conscious contact with God, I don't think, or well, it can be conscious contact with a, a being. Sometimes people sense a being, but it doesn't need to be that. It means contact in my consciousness. So when I'm aware either of the knowledge of God's will for me, when I'm suddenly clear about what I need to do in a situation and it just comes as a bolt from the blue, uh, or when I feel sufficient resources to do that, I literally have conscious contact with God, um, or at least with the commodities that come from God. So this can all be pitched in a way which is palatable to people that have a problem with with God and religion and spirituality. It's very, very practical 
it's it's about the the business end of the relationship with God, uh, about what what God wants me to do today. Bob D, very good on all of this. If you can catch, I I can't I don't know which talk, but I've heard him say it on a number of occasions about the um about the the dangers of going too far into the other spiritual paths and saying when he gets off track he ha- he remembers he has to do that other stuff in addition to not say that i'm not i'm not saying don't do it if you want to go and do whatever religious or spiritual things and knock yourself out but one does it in addition to step 11 in the book not instead of and it comes under the heading of there are many useful books also um suggestions about these may be obtained from one's priest minister or rabbi um and be quick to see where religious people are right and there are other points in the big book where it does point you towards you know go and find go and rejoin your local religious or spiritual community but i I think that's absolutely right that the core of it is this knowledge of god's will for me and the power to carry that out so what do i do with sponsees well first of all i explain all that which is the the premise behind it and all the other stuff which does alter your consciousness and raise your consciousness and establish a sense of safety and identity in god or purpose in god or value in god is all very very good um but i've got a friend in bristol i won't say his name because um well i shouldn't really that's why um but he sticks very very closely to this notion and he's sober a very long time uh, very closely to this notion of God being good, orderly direction. It's a very British way of looking at it, I think, good, orderly direction. Um, and there's a chap in Somerset, I know, sort of 45, 50 years sober, who's, who's, who's very similar, very, very practical, doesn't talk about God at all. But my friend in Bristol reports him as saying, whenever he sees this chap in Somerset, his car is always full of newcomers. And I think that's the best demonstration of spirituality is people are on the phone the whole time. My friend Melody, when I was new, whenever you said, Melody, can we go for a coffee? She said, well, no, I'm meeting a newcomer outside Pont Street. I'm meeting a newcomer outside the World MPA. She's always always meeting a newcomer. The most spiritual thing you can do, I think, is, is meet or, or talking to a newcomer. So, um, uh, Step 11 in the book is is very much about, so if the substance of the day is step 12, so higher consciousness, service within AA, service outside AA, uh, step 11 is the means. So as soon as someone has committed to the program, um, however, in whatever rudimentary way, I give them, I've got a little... uh, little notes that I give and say this is what a daily program looks like and it includes it includes step 11 uh, basically the instructions from from page 86 to 88 so they're doing this right from the beginning I get them to get a little coterie of pals together I direct them towards some particular people who I sponsor who I know are, are, are a safe pair of hands for this and say you what you want to do is you want to run through your day your previous 24 hours with someone do a review if they want you to send it you send the review so you do a review and you talk it through with someone else let the corrective measures from there flow into the plan for the next day do a plan for the day run it past a grown-up um um uh, and to run it past someone who is going to be actively feeding back and interfering with it um uh the, it, it's no good having someone that's just going to say oh yes marvelous to everything when it's not because people don't they I'm, i didn't know how to live i had no clue dumb one dumb idea after another <laughs> someone described history as one damn thing after another that's what my, my plans for the day looked like one damn thing after another so i needed people to say that's a really really bad idea so I encourage people to find a group of because what what you don't want with your sponsees is for them to become dependent on you or to see you as some kind of sole authority. There's a tradition in AA. A friend of mine in New York was it? I'm sure I've told this story. I've got limited numbers, so it's like a merry-go-round. All the horses come round again eventually. Uh, you just have to sit and watch it for long enough. Um, 
friend in New York was at a meeting and the secretary um, uh, didn't show up or the chair didn't show up. The person who's going to be taking the meeting is sober and said, you know, Steve, can you take the can you take the meeting tonight? He said, I'll just check with my sponsor. And he went over the road and went over and asked his sponsor if he could do this, if this was allowed. And and the sponsor gave him this sort of papal blessing. Um, and then he went and took the meeting. It's all I, it's very... Tim, we've kind of lost you. I think. Has everybody else lost him? Right. Where did I lose you? Papal, oh, bless- a... papal blessing. Papal blessing. <laughs> so he gave him his papal... Luckily, I've got two internet connections, so we're, we're good um, eventually. Anyway, the point is... Uh, what you don't want is to become like the sole source, the only person they're talking to. They've got to be talking to a whole bunch of people and getting to know a bunch of people. Often, they, you know, you give them a half a dozen people to talk to. They discover they like them more and immediately switch to them as sponsors. This is good. If there's someone better, they should be with that person. You don't want to hug everyone to yourself. Um, This is also great for your own sponsees because it it gives them an opportunity to be trained on people without having like the full responsibility. So people get used to what the practice looks like without, you know, formally having these as as permanent sponsees. And it shares the work around the group, really, because if if you're sober a long time, you're just going to get asked a lot. Um, So I get people to work with them evening review and their morning planning for the day, which must be integrated. The, so the corrective measures need to flow into the next morning's um, planning. I get them to run through that with some people, um, find the people it works well with, and then um, come to me with any headlines every day. Um, what, what I'm discovering at the moment, I, I sort of stopped doing this for a while, but I think it's the best thing. Uh, well, I may change my mind, but I think the best thing is with anyone in the first few months is to be calling you daily. And it doesn't need to be a protracted conversation. What I get people to do is to call daily with whatever step work they've completed in the last 24 hours or call daily and call daily with whatever um, particular instruction I've given someone recently, which works very well. What's your biggest internal problem of the last 24 hours? What's your biggest external problem of the last 24 hours? And that's very helpful because it means you can feed them solutions right from the beginning. Uh, because this is the, you know, the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. Some people will come to you to do a sort of academic run through the program, but they want everyone to stay out of their lives and their lives are a catastrophe. Uh, and what you don't want is to sort of wait while these you know, catastrophes are unfurling around them, like wondering why they're so crazy. Well, it's because no one is addressing the crap that's going on. So I find that everything, if I'm doing that, what, you know, what's the biggest drama, internal drama, external drama of the last 24 hours, which you process, already talked to, to a couple of people about. So by the time it's processed with a couple of people, you get a much cleaner version than the kind of raw sewage, which you know, comes out of people when the situation is completely fresh. If you can have fresh raw sewage, I'm not sure that's a appropriate metaphor. But anyway, um, you get the point. By the time they've talked to a couple of people, it's clearer already, and then you can really provide helpful direction. They know what's happened. They they've worked. They've figured figured out at least the basics. So you're integrating the program with their life right from the beginning, but you're not the sole authority. There's a whole group of people. If you've got five people telling them, you're crazy, you're approaching that, you know, this is not helping, then they'll believe it. If it's one person, it's them against you. And I've had a lot of them against me, against the sponsee in the past. When they, that does not happen, but there's a whole group of people they're talking to who have got their heads screwed on. They don't think that it's one person against them. It's the power of the group. And, but it works through there being, you know, lots of one to one interactions um, regarding the content of the evening and the morning routines. If people want to do their, you know, their readings and their breathing and the chanting and all of that, obviously I'm not going to disturb any of that. But the morning has to contain the plan for the day. 
And I get people at the beginning to do pretty strict plans for the day. And this, I think this is so important, particularly the ones with, who are slippery in terms of the, the not drinking bit of the program. Um, because very often what people will do is leave huge chunks of time in which the thought spontaneously then occurs to them to drink. And of course, it isn't spontaneously occurring. It's specifically left a four hour gap between work and having to be home in order to, oh, I'll just figure something out in the moment, knowing subconsciously but that when they get to that, oh, I feel like a drink now. And then they go and drink. Um, I ne- My schedule when I was new was nailed down for me so that I knew at every moment of the day exactly where I was supposed to be. And there wasn't, I couldn't have squeezed, you couldn't have squeezed a, a you couldn't have squeezed a cigarette paper in between the various appointments in my schedule, uh, let alone a full-blown relapse. Uh, my first sponsor, Doug, said that the worst thing for an alco- alcoholic is unstructured free time. So I get people with the morning meditation to focus very much on a solid plan for the day. Um, um, and... Sometimes I've reviewed these and that people write the most extraordinary things. I, I can't tell you all the wonderful things because in case the person's listening to this tape, but people can make a meal out of ordinary everyday things. I'll just leave it at that, like stuff which would take you or me eight minutes, four minutes, two minutes. There's like a whole hour set aside, you know. Um, so the, the, the plans are, are very revealing about what's actually going on for them. The other thing about the daily call, which so in the morning, by the time they get to you, uh, hopefully they've done a nice early morning meeting. There are lots of 7 a.m., 6.30, 6, 6, 6.30, 7 a.m. meetings around, um, particularly in continental Europe. There are, if you're in the UK, you can get to 8 a.m. meetings in Europe, which are 7 a.m. in the UK. There are, so hopefully they, by the time they speak to you at around nine o'clock, They've been to a meeting. They've gone through their review from the night before. uh, They've done a plan for the day. They've run it past a couple of people. Then you can really add value as a sponsor on the top of all of that. Also, the other thing I find with this daily calling, people are this. This is like this is kind of dog psychology thing. Uh, People are much more vulnerable in the morning in that I don't mean in terms of woundable. I mean, they're kind of not with it enough to conceal what's going on by the time they've got to the evening they've been performing for 12 hours and they're these you know perfect representations of what someone should be in the morning people are just aren't with it enough to cover their tracks and listen to what people say and how they say it. it's super revealing it's not what they it's the things they inadvertently say it's the language it's the language they use which reveals what what's really going going on and that provides the material for the conversation most of the time um i mean one one thing which I, i've i've had in it is, is, isn't one particular person if they're listening you know if you're listening and you recognize yourself you're not the only one it's not all about you some of us but a very common uh, topic is about discipline with the program and it does indeed in step 11 talk about god will discipline us but when when i've noticed when people say i need more discipline the problem is a lack of enthusiasm, because when you're enthusiastic about something, you don't need discipline. And it's just like with drinking. I didn't need discipline to drink every day because I was enthusiastic about it. <laughs> it <laughs> so so someone, you know, and it, I, I get I think someone says it about once a week. Yeah, I need to be more disciplined about this. And of course, that won't work absolutely won't work because if you if you could muster the discipline you would have done it already it's not about discipline when people don't realize they're going to reveal anything by saying that. i have no idea because it, it's an aside it, and it looks like it looks like it's the right thing to say so listen i i try to listen very very carefully i read between the lines in those conversations um with the evening review um you go to meetings we'll talk about doing their step tens and they do this long long rehash of a step four um uh and i think we talked about this last week and i don't i don't really i don't really do that what i'm looking for out of the evening review is corrective measures for tomorrow 
There's no point in analyzing things for the sake of analyzing it. The point is to figure out uh, what I need to believe, think, and do differently tomorrow. That's what the key is. So where it says, were we resentful, it doesn't say, what were we resentful about? But almost everyone I know does an evening review. This is in the past, you know, almost, well, 28, 29 years. Almost everyone thinks it's write lots of things about all the people that bother you. No, 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 no. Were you resentful? In other words, were you indulging that character defect? Ditto with fear. It doesn't say, what are you frightened about? It says, were you frightened? In other words, were you indulging the fear? And then you've got a completely different question. Because the real question then is, isn't that interesting? You know, uh, I'll ask myself, isn't that interesting how attracted I am to finding fault with other people or things in the world? And it's always because I feel guilty or awkward or ashamed or embarrassed or inadequate in myself, which is why I'm looking for someone else whose fault it is more than mine. So the real question with resentment and fear is what's my investment that is giving rise to this? It's never about the content. The, con the so-called content is the, is the blank screen onto which all of that stuff is being projected. Now, sometimes you need to do a little bit of, you know, um, uh, detailed work on the content. But the, the, the danger is believing that if you get rid of the content somehow, the, the resentment will go away. And it won't, because the next day, if the reason why you're resentful, which is internal, which has got to do with an internal state of mind, if that isn't resolved, you'll simply find something else the next day. And the two, the two things which I find sort of persistent when people do these reviews um, is uh, either the same thing coming up day after day after day after day on the review or it looks like a different thing but it's the same thing wearing a different hat you know say so one person it will always be people in authority who are trying to belittle them or not giving them enough credit for instance and every day it's a it's a new example and it looks like a, and it's can i read you my inventory and of course there's no new information there and so um that's why the, I think the focus must be getting the corrected measures on the table and the review the following day is how diligent were you in implementing those corrected measures. For, for instance, if it's fear, um, you know, how diligently did you uh, recite memorized prayers about God's protection? How many times did you recite Psalm 91 today? Well, I didn't. I just sat in fear. Ah, you see, that's the problem then. It's not about the thing you're frightened of. It's the indulgence of it. So the, the, the focus I, I, I take with people on the review is very different to what most people do. It's not that other people are doing it wrong. This is just what I do. So, so it's, all about, it's all about corrective measures. And I think the corrective measures business, business and the sane and sound ideal. So at the end of eight and nine, do a sane and sound ideal uh, for each problematical area which represents the ideals to which we'll, towards which we're willing to grow. And then on a daily basis, there are corrective measures for, 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 for the more minute adjustments. And I think this is the engine of change. Unless I've got a vision for what I should be, I can't, I can't move towards it. So um, uh, uh, it sounds like it's September, but it's not because it's the, it's the nightly it's the nightly review. Um, now, then, if the corrective measures aren't being implemented, you get to the really interesting question, which is about willingness. Why isn't there the willingness to do this? What's going on? And that's when you really get to the core. It, getting too involved in the so-called content of the psychological stuff, the resentments, the fears, the aversions, the attractions, um, getting too absorbed in the content of that, you can end up never asking the real question about willingness to change your entire point of view about everything. 
Um, so that's the mistake I've made, getting super involved in the detail and then finding you're, you're just, it's like chasing, it's like a dog chasing its tail and you and the sponsee together form one sort of unholy dog chasing its tail and you're sort of constantly trying to, to get them to do the programme, but they're, every day they come up with another, you know, wheelbarrow full of material and you're constantly pro you're, you're bailing out this wheelbarrow every day and the next day they go and fill it up again and bring to you all the things they fill the wheelbarrow with now if you don't get past the content content you can you can stay stuck in that for a long time and i think that's probably classed as an alanon slip to do that to not and of course uh, when you try and go, beyond, people love you ab addressing the content. People hate getting behind it and looking at questions of real questions of willingness to live the corrective measures. And that's how you know you're getting close to the truth is when the real resistance comes up. Um, and the funny thing was, there was someone I was sponsoring a few years ago. And this is actually this isn't one person. It was like several people, where they they the people sober a long time. They phone up and say, "Can I read my inventory to you? Can I read it to you?" And if I said no, they were so disappointed. I said, "No, let's talk about something else." And they didn't want to do that. They wanted to. They, it was like there was some. It's like that sort of in in one of the religions. I'm told people will gain absolution and then see themselves having license to sin again because they've been uh, they've done the penance and it's like as a sponsor you can become the person that they they come to very sort of guiltily to reveal all the bad stuff they've done or thought in order to then clear the decks to go and do it again and so i've got to be terribly careful not to be not to be become part of that system so i've become part of the problem my sponsor talks about the, the the crocodile tears of sincere sincerity insincere sincerity and it's the same sometimes with slippers you get this people that relapse on repeatedly on alcohol although the question is are they relapsing or did they did they ever really stop forever um the the issue is this sort of cycle and it talks about the cycle in the doctor's opinion emerging remorseful and then they call you and they set them going again. And then over weeks or months, they drift and then they drink again. And then it's the well-known stages, stages of the spree. And you're just it's like the stations of the cross. You're just one of the stops on this endless cycle. So um, I, I'm very, very alert now to being part of one of those cycles where the time in AA is the necessary penance to go back and slip again. Um, because then if you give AA, and this is the other thing, if you give AA a really good go and you slip, it's not your fault if you slip. So you don't have to feel guilty about it because AA clearly didn't work. So some of the slippiest people are some of the best at doing the program when they come back. And this dynamic works similarly with people with lots of very, very high drama. Uh, that there are there's a well there's a cycle of the drama escalates and escalates and escalates and then they come to you and you process it and they're cleaned out and everything's fine and then it all builds from scratch again and again it's exactly the same as with the people who are repeatedly drinking and so the way to get at those is to be looking at the uh, this is why the daily calling and, and if someone is presenting with systemic problems. So the daily calling, I get people to call daily in their first few when they're doing, doing the steps the, for the first time when they're coming back off a relapse or if they're presenting systemic problems. So sort of generalized depression or anxiety or something like that after several years in AA and they've done the program you know six times seven times nine times and they're in a bad way and what's so interesting is that it that the sticking point is always the implementation of the corrective measures it's always where the problem lies I, I one example um uh, is and, and this is again not one particular person it's lots of people I've seen over the years where this, if the solution is step 12 and really engaging in step 12 
Uh, and the problem is this sort of relentless return into self-obsession and old mental patterns of victimhood and blame and self-pity and self-indulgence and all of those. I speak from experience here. My first 16 years were not pretty. Um, the solution is step 12. And if you just tell people and they totally buy that, you spend a week you know, preparing for that launch into step 12, unless it's then monitored daily, it just drifts away. And what's so interesting, when I get people on a thing where they, they call every day with what their step 12 stuff is, you find out very quickly that even a week later, the enthusiasm has waned for the step 12 stuff and corners are being cut straight away. And you can hold people to what they agreed they were doing just by looking at it on a daily basis. And then eventually it's like, it's like holding a plant in new soil and you kind of have to what the plant wants to do is pull up its roots and run away and it's like you're holding the plant there until the roots take and then the roots take and then they're fine but there, there is a period where and i this was done with me where where you need to be held to it and i do it daily other my sponsor when my my sponsor was doing it was doing it weekly just because of his schedule so i i prefer five minutes i'd rather have five minutes a day than one hour a week uh, but it's this this daily cycle. It, it's being part of that daily cycle where people get to reveal what's not working, have corrective measures and implement them. I think that's the powerhouse of the whole thing. And without someone else uh, intimately on the inside of that process, it tends not to people who are some people are, are, are self, like self basting chickens. They're, they're absolutely fine. They're, they're, they're up and running. Other people will have a tendency to close back in on themselves and go back into the old patterns. And it's with those people that I find it most, most useful to do that daily, daily business with. So that's all I got on step 11. So I'll hand it back to you, Alistair, to see if there are any, any questions from our dazed onlookers. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, the meeting is now open for questions for Tim, which can be done by the raised hand function in Zoom, or you can message me through the chat function and I will ask Tim directly. And if all else fails, please wave your hand at the camera and I will try to get you. Um, and we normally uh, try to close on the hour, but it's very informal, so we uh, may run past. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Harry. Hey everyone, I'm Mary, I'm an alcoholic. Thanks, Tim. Uh, this, could be, this could be a bit of a sprawling one, apologies. So, um, you talked a little bit about, so about, I'd say less than half of my sponsees have even said they're even willing to do ex just what it says in the book. Um, they'll always tag things on and turn it into mindfulness meditation, all sorts of stuff. And like you said, so my approach is, Okay, well, you can do whatever you like, you know, in addition, as long as you're, you're, you're giving the, the, the core stuff here a fair go. So the question is really about, but all of them say, it's about the point, what's the point of step 11? It says it's about improving our conscious contact with God. So how do you know if what you're doing is improving your conscious contact with God? Because actually, most really, I don't think this is unfair. People will say, well, it's maybe with mindfulness meditation, for example, in my case, it gave me a better ability to see my thoughts as distinct things that were separate from me. So that's one material benefit. But, you know, most of the time it's, it makes me feel better. I have a bliss out um, and I feel floaty. Um, and that's how they evaluate it as being a good sort of step 11 thing. But none of them have been like, as part of my step 11, I did a IT course, you know, to make it more useful at work or, you know, so how do you evaluate whether something's improving your conscious contact with God? What a lot of questions. I've written some of them down. Um, so now what's the point is an intro. I think that needs to be covered first. Um, you see, I'm, I'm going to go against everything I said and start quoting A Course in Miracles here. So, you know, there we go. Um, but there's a, a section of Course in Miracles, which is one of the more practical ones. You know how some of those sections about lilies are not necessarily super obvious how you apply them. But there's a section called Rules for Decision. Um, what the, the basic gist is this. Uh, you can't make any decision without a guide. Now, the guide is either your ego or it's the 
or it's the higher power. So you get to pick one. If you don't actively pick the higher power, because the ego is always there and the ego, ego always answers first, you will be following your ego. There is, you can't not make decisions because you have to live. You have to have a day. So you're going to be making decisions. The only question is, where are you going to get the decisions from? So what's the point of step 11 is to... Uh, to seek direction from your higher power rather than from your ego. Why would you want to do that? Because uh, the ego can only bring fear, frustration, disappointment, and despair. That's fear, frustration, disappointment, and despair. Because the purpose of the ego is to establish for me a separate identity in the material world as exhibited by the material form that we appear to inhabit. And then to make that identity and form special in some way. And if you look at the material world, it's notoriously difficult to make a name for yourself on a planet with 8 billion people. And it's notoriously difficult to achieve any sort of permanence for yourself when you are made 90% of water on a planet where water evaporates at room temperature. People are very squashable and evaporatable. It, it's... Uh, and the ego, so, and the, so the ego's plans uh, are all about trying to secure some kind of eternal value from a place which is endlessly dangerous and mutable, whether it's materially or, or in terms of reputation and things like that. So, so that the, it's got to be understood in step three that the ego-based life. I'm not making this up. This is directly from the book. A life run on self-will can hardly be a success. There we go. Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction from this world if he only manages well? So it's based on the idea. Hopefully the idea is bought that uh, you're on a hiding to nothing with the ego. So the smart money is to go with the higher power. And once that idea is understood, then you've got a basis for explaining what is step 11. Step 11 is the process by, by which you actively deliberately consciously manually override your ego and go straight to the boss you want to you kind of want to be a carrot uh, 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 sorry i shouldn't say karen with karen w here but you know that the, the dreadful meme in america of the karen who who says i want to see the manager you want to be a karen here you want to be like karen you want to see the manager you want to see the boss you don't, you don't want to palm yourself. You don't want to fob yourself off with your ego. You want to go straight to the boss, get the good stuff from behind the counter. So that's the point of step 11 is to insist, it is to develop, is to take your sense of entitlement and in, say, I'm entitled to the best possible guidance for my life in order to make the best possible decisions to have the best possible outcome, which is peace. I'm entitled to that. Give it to me. Um, and that's super helpful because it's taking what looks like a character defect, which is belligerence and entitlement and turning them into virtues. So you're fighting not against something, but for what is your inheritance, which is a much better life. Um, Bob Olson. Bob Olson is an AA speaker from Colorado. In I want to say Inglewood, Colorado. Is that a place... In anyway, I think he's from there. On those on the sites, it will say, you know, so and so from so and so, because there are lots of Bob this is and Bob that. So Bob Olson from 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 Colorado, um, or maybe Littleton. I don't know. Anyway, he's very good on this. He says, if you honestly want to seek your higher powers, will and you take the actions of asking, you better bot you you better bet your bottom dollar that what comes down the tubes to you is more likely to be God's will than if you just run on automatic. And any, I think any experience of step 11 will prove this, that e even if you don't get the knowledge during the day, you're more sensitized to ideas which are not ordinarily your own stuff that other people say is just going to bother you more. It gets in like it, 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 wears away the varnish um how do you know it's worked uh 
there are two ways. Well, actually, there are three ways. The first, four, there are four ways. <laughs> the list is growing as we speak. So the first way is to uh, listen to the tone of the voice. So if the to if, if if the action indicated through the step eleven process is about fear, um, resentment, guilt, shame, bracket sin would be the traditional word for shame, the sense of there being something wrong with you in addition to having done something wrong. Fear, resentment, guilt, shame, attraction and aversion. Those are the six you want to look out for. If it's to do with those, uh, then you might want to be suspicious. Uh, the I, I behaved very badly on one particular protracted occasion about 11 years ago. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't telling my sponsor that there was dirty work afoot. And when I finally revealed the situation, which I'm not going to go into here, when I finally revealed the content of the situation to my sponsor, I said, I'm now kind of stuffed because I don't know whether to like you're saying I should go to God. But I'd been going to God throughout this whole thing. And I genuinely thought I was doing the right thing. He said, did you pray for the good of all? And I suddenly realized, no. And that's a really good test. So on one hand, is it based on fear, resentment, guilt, shame, attraction or aversion? Or is it is it based on uh, acting for the good of all, which is uh, dovetails beautifully with tradition one and unity and common welfare? And when I think of all of my little sort of emotional jags, which have resulted in behavior, which I thought was justified, often in the service structure, I've been an absolute ogre. Um, when I apply that test retrospectively, was I acting out of one of those six or was I acting for the good of all? Oh, there was, I always had an angle. I was, I always had an angle when I was behaving badly. So I think it's a terribly good test. It is looking at what the tone of it is. Is it, is it, is it, is it, does it come from a place of goodness or does it come up from a place of one of the other ones? You can always compare it to the principles of the program. This is the second thing. Uh, does it accord, you know, does it accord with the principle in the big book? If so, which page is it on? Which principle? Which line? Give us the quotation very helpful particularly if you take um chapters uh, eight and nine as guides to interacting with other people and you extract the principles from there and test your proposed course of action against those seven eight and nine actually chapter seven eight and nine that's really helpful you run it past a grown-up now, don't run it past seven grown ups because you won't get a quorum probably. And then it then you just end up picking the one that you are going to do anyway. So have a couple of super trusted grown ups to push these things past. That's three things. How do you tell if it's God's will? Fourth thing um, is is you have to try it out and see if it works or not. And if it's not, if it doesn't work, you admit it promptly um, and you find out pretty quickly usually so i think that combination of looking at the tone of the voice behind it but like the intent behind it comparing it to principle um running it past a grown-up and uh tr you know try it out see what happens uh, and you get a pretty good view there emotional state so transcendental states are not necessarily a good sign that you've actually contacted that you, you you're in contact with god's will um very often um god's will comes in the form of a very uncomfortable awareness of where one is going wrong like super uncomfortable it is not it's different than guilt and shame which are kind of self-indulgent um um morasses that one can swim around in and are kind of attractive in some way that it's just this gnawing awareness that one's got it wrong and one needs to do it differently that's the best test is oh my god i've got this wrong for seven years what i really ought to be doing is speaking in single sentences as opposed to you know james joyce novels for instance yeah 
So um, anyway, I think that's, I hope that's covered your questions, Harry. Can I, can I just respond by quickly saying, because I, I find it quite interesting that, so in the, in the, in the step, uh, sorry, in the big book, step 11, in the 12 and 12, step 11, even in the uh, appendix to spiritual, not once does it say this is going to feel good. <laughs> it says, we you know, we ask to be, you know, save us from self-pity, but it doesn't ever, now I feel pretty good a lot of the time, but it doesn't say, you know, you are really going to be uh, floating here. <laughs> it, it, it never really seems to give me that sense at all. So there we go. Absolutely, yeah. Seamus. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Tim. Lots of food for thought there. Um, I want to go back to ground that you covered in the first five, ten minutes um, about alternative belief systems. Um, can you work with the grain of that or, or, or not? I haven't had too much trouble with um, people having uh, religious beliefs. Um, I can think of one guy who um th- thought he was born again and that kind of gave him a, a free pass on um most what you might call <laughs> what he might have called the spiritual side of the program um and it was the kind of born again church where god wants his people to be prosperous so it comes with comes with goodies so you could sort of go to church and and pray for goodies and that maybe brings me to the 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 bigger point the the the, the nub of the question which is um the kind of new age belief that you can manifest things um, and attract things through the power of positive thinking. Uh, I find this is very widespread uh, in, in AA. Um, one here's it sort of alluded to um, in meetings and it's not just a new age thing. It has its roots in, uh, in the power of positive thinking, um, which appears to have deep roots in American culture. You know, the idea that if you want to achieve something, you have to, vision it positively and then you will kind of like um get it now i can see how negative thinking will attract negative things and i think the spirit of that is in is in step 11 you know what you said about resentment dishonesty fear and um and 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 selfishness but it's never been clear to me that the converse is true that that one can um somehow um conjure into existence um positive goodies by thinking more positively about them how does one deal with that um enough of question i once went to a sponsor um i i said to him uh, the, the, a friend of mine was going through some sort of difficult time and i said to my sponsor what should i do and my sponsor said hide just hide um, and that was very good advice, in fact. Um, the individual in question is now sort of a, 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 a famous uh, um, editor and journalist and columnist. So um, so everything turned out well in the end. Um, but anyway, um, the, uh, yes, I, I find all of that stuff a bit disagreeable, really, to put it mildly. However... However, there's a little bit of Emmett Fox, which touches on things like that. Um, uh, Much certainly, um, what's his name? Norman Vincent Peale. And I think there's more, my experience, I've used both extensively, and I think there is more good than ill in both. But it's, I think it's a very banal and um, ridiculous application of that principle to turn it into, you know, sort of Ferraris and swimming pools and promotions. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that my life is chiefly limited by my limited perception of it. And to have those limitations lifted by envisioning a much more expansive, interesting life I think is absolutely the solution. But I think it must be applied to um, uh, more abstract commodities like uh, kindness and diligence and uh, interest and curiosity and all those sort of virtues that, um, you know, I, I find it very easy to write myself off as a sort of bag of character defects bumbling through the world like the the castle in Howl's Moving Castle. You know, it works, but it's not elegant. Um, But actually, that the 
the the I think the only I've held myself back by not by not visualizing that I could be different, that I could be a more expansive, a kinder, and a more useful person. Um, uh, that it, what your question reminds me of a lot of what Anthony DeMello writes about taking perfectly sound spiritual principles and making a complete mockery of them by running them through the materialistic framework. So there's, there's uh, a wonderful Anthony DeMello story about ants and their conception of God and how some very learned ants argue about, they all agree that uh, when we go to the other realm when, when the ants go to the higher realm that they're going to that, that, that they're going to have a uh, that, that if they've lost their sting during their life the sting will be restored but the question is whether they have two stings or three or something like that so that the that their theological framework is limited by the fact that they're ants and their conception of god is limited by so they can only imagine god as an ant but bigger than them and I think it's the same. As if you, so if you've got a, a materialistic framework and you grab hold of spiritual principles without uh, sufficient training and, and, and uh, dismantling of the materialistic structure, you'll simply redeploy. You're, you'll simply recreate yourself using that. You'll, you'll assimilate like the Borg. You'll assimilate the so-called spirituality into your existing framework. Whereas, of course, if you get rid of that framework and then you adopt the spirituality, you're getting a clean, a clean version of it. Um, I had a, a sponsee. I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but he, he's he's rather sort of amusing about the whole thing. And he did the whole manifesting thing for a couple of years. And I sort of left him alone with it. He didn't really ask me anything about it. He just did it. And he came to me after a couple of years. He said, it was a whole load of bullshit, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yes. He, but he had to go through it and try it and realise that it's all sort of ridiculous. I think he was trying to manifest a career and it just didn't happen. Um, so I don't, get, I don't get too involved in it because if people are very bought into it, there's nothing you can nothing you can say or do, but I just gently point them towards pages 60, 60 um, and 61, and that seems to send them running for the hills, or, or they just never talk about it to me again. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. Thanks, Tim. Anyone else have a question for Tim? i just say one more thing about that. If it's true with the manifesting thing, it's true with other things is people are at liberty to do whatever they want but one's got to recognize what the program says and it uh, and on 87 it talks very clearly about not praying for selfish ends and you can only pray if other people will be helped so you, you can point out you, you said well you do what you want but you be, be aware that it is the opposite of what the aa program is suggesting and you get to pick but don't think that just because what you're doing comes under a spiritual or religious heading, it's necessarily compatible with the with the program. Uh, that's a point that I think is worth making to people. Can I just ask one more quick one? So you just uh, you just fired something up for me. So I think a lot of the confusion or, or the difference in the approach to step eleven, whether you stick very close to the big book or you go totally off piece and stuff, is down to a sort of idea that well, the program is what you choose it to be. So, where are you at with that? So, <laughs> you're quite big bookie, but it's not our job to convince anyone that's the case, right? You can you can take it or you can do something else. Is that where you're at? Oh, well, I'm going to say something so awful. No one will talk to me again after this. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, the program was devised by specific people at a specific time in a specific context with a specific purpose. And unfortunately, they established that as being the AA program. Uh, they wrote it and they were pretty clear. They were unclear about certain things. It's as Alan G says, that it's clear up to a point. It's clear what it, it's clear about, but it's silent on many things and leaves a lot of things to people's own discretion. Like the exact form of step five does not tell you how to do it. it gives you general principles. Other things, it's super, super, super specific. But in as far as they've written it down, that is what they agreed one way or another 
I mean, it's a bit, it was a messy process, but essentially it reflects what they believe the programme was. Um, and the programme came before the fellowship and came before the book. Now, if someone does something else, that may work better. But it's not the AA programme. It's a kind of version. It's their own version of it. And that's, that's not a bad thing. But it is, I don't think you can, you can say this is the AA programme when it's, when it's radically. Now, people have their own takes on things, their own versions of things. Everyone does the big book slightly differently. So there, there, there's obviously huge amounts of variation within that. But things which are radically different, I'll give you an example of one, if I may. Uh, there was a woman in, in, in oh, why it's a woman, it's irrelevant, it could have been a man, um, in Al-Anon many years ago, who said, uh, who read off the, the wall, the, the, the steps on the wall, step five, the exact nature of our wrongs, well, those are the wrongs that were done to me. So in my step five, I told someone else all the terrible things that had ever been done to me. And that was step five. Now, that's, she's done a step. But it's not, it's not Al-Anon's step five, it's her step five. It may be better than Al-Anon's step five, but it's not Al-Anon's step five. So I'm, I'm sceptical about uh, relabeling things, the AA steps, when, when, they're, when they're not. And that's why I'm kind of big bookie, really. And the, the reason why I'm big bookie is because it actually is not doctrinal. It's just because I, it's what I found to work better than anything else. And if I if something else worked better, I would be doing it, and you'd have a different speaker this evening. So that's what I've got on that. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Claire. Hi there. I'm sorry. I think I guess we're running out of time. So a question would be: Is there any? Would you see that there being any risk of the Course in Miracles sort of unraveling the twelve step program in a way uh, when when a person can go very far into the course? And at what point must you put down the course? Um, yeah, good question. Listen to Ken Wapnick about this. He's absolutely brilliant and completely scathing, actually. In, in, if, if you think I'm scathing, listen to Ken Wapnick talk about the Course, uh, course in Miracles students, um, about how disconcerting it is when you're out for dinner with Course in Miracles students and they try and pray to the Holy Spirit or to Jesus as to whether to have the chicken entree or the beef. And of course, from the from the Course in Miracles perspective, uh, you know, uh, God is unaware of the existence of the material world. So to ask God whether you should have chicken or beef is neither here nor there. And, and what he's very clear about, and this is brilliant, this is just brilliant because it applies to all spiritual paths, is make a distinction between the metaphysical and the physical. These are different realms. So whatever metaphysical understanding you have, don't... Uh, they inform each other the two realms inform each other but do not get them confused so when you say well nothing is real it's all an illusion everything is a projection of the ego mind yes it is but you still but still brush your teeth have a dental hygienist get a pension you know be nice to other people even though it's only their ego that's affected you still get to try and be nice to them you know six days out of seven so not to mix the two levels so if you don't mix the two levels you keep the aa program first and you go to a, a, a shed load of meetings and look out for new people and ask them if they've stopped shaking yet then i think you're minimizing the risk that you'll disappear so far up yourself that no one ever sees you again Thanks, Tim. Um, and with that, I think um, I'll hand the ma meeting back to you and ask you to uh, close with the serenity prayer. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.